Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am requesting an approval of the agenda, please. It's been approved by Councillor Miller, seconded by Councillor Thompson on the question. Please vote now. Motion carried unanimously. Good evening, everyone, here in the Council Chambers of Quispam Sis on March 21st, 2023, and welcome to everyone that's watching us virtually. It has certainly been a busy period since we last met, and I'd like to get you caught up on a few things that have taken place over the last little while. I was very proud to represent and speak on behalf of International Women's Day on March the 8th. The crowd reached full capacity at the Bill McGuire Centre in Rosse, which once again co-hosted the event with the town of Quispam Sis. We heard wonderful words of encouragement and enlightenment from New Brunswick's Lieutenant Governor Brenda Murphy. And I'd also like to extend a thank you to Deputy Mayor Scryer for her hard work in setting this up and hosting the event again this year. I recently attended an information and fireside chat with UMBSJ to learn about the Integrated Health Initiative. At the campus, there'll be a new building built that will house about 500 students, and that will address some of the gaps in our healthcare system over the coming years. I also want to congratulate members of the Kennebec Cases Regional Police Force and the Regional Board of Police Commissioners who were honored on Thursday night at the Queen's Platinum Jubilee Medal Ceremony right here at our, our town hall. I had the pleasure of delivering closing remarks, recognizing their commitment and dedication to one of the top forces in all of Canada. In fact, I believe over the past five years, they've been uh, in the top five and twice, I believe they were the number one force across Canada for a force their size. I also had the honor of speaking with Ms. White's grade 10 civics class at Kennedy Cases Valley High School. It was wonderful to see so many young students engaged in political discussions. And they asked great questions. And as a retired school teacher, it was uh, certainly nice to be back in front of the class. And just another reminder that the month of March is Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. If you have a family history of colorectal cancer, please be sure to ask your doctor for uh, colonoscopy. And uh, certainly it's a genetic uh, disease, so anyone that is in your family should have that diagnosis or should have a colonoscopy 15 years prior to the diagnosis of the age of the uh, family member. And for all those others uh, within our community, you can have an FOB test, which is the fecal occult blood test that is available at your doctor's office, and you can do it at home, put it in the mail, and uh, it's as simple as that. And in case you missed it, our outdoor skating rink is closed, but as one season ends, we have a beautiful spring day to begin today, the first full day of spring, and other amenities will be opening. So we look forward to the coming days and longer days of sunlight. So thank you for that, and I'm going to call upon Councillor Kirk Miller to read the treaty acknowledgement and the moment of reflection. Kirk, please. Light's not coming on. Oh, thank you. Uh, we would like to respectfully, respectfully acknowledge that Quispamsis exists on the traditional territory of the Willis Tawig, Maliseet, and Mi'kmaq people, whose ancestors, along with the Passamaquoddy tribe, signed peace and friendship treaties with the British Crown in the 1700s. We'd like to take this moment to pay respect to the elders, past and present, and the descendants of this traditional territory. We'd also like to take this moment to reflect on solidarity and support for the people of Ukraine acknowledging that Canada has the third largest Ukrainian population in the world behind Ukraine itself and Russia. And may we remind ourselves that 
of the important work we have before us tonight. May we make good decisions without prejudice or bias and always in the best interest of our community, which we are here to serve. Thank you, Councillor Miller. I'm now looking for a disclosure of interests. Seeing there are none, we will move on to item number five, presentations. Tonight's presentation, 640091, NB Inc., 8 Leiden Drive, PID number 54619, residential R1 to commercial, uh, commercial CC, proposed parking lot, development and storage shed to support business at 170 Hampton Road. And I'm going to read the public presentation procedure. And this is to remind you that this is simply a public presentation. We have been asked as mayor and council to plan and uh, consider amending its municipal bylaw number 54. We have set this day and place for a public presentation. I would like to note that objections to the proposed amendment may be made within 30 days of the public presentation uh, when we will at that time have a public hearing. So to the proponent, the proponent will make a presentation for their rezoning application proposal. This is what we are going to do this evening. Following the presentation, council and or the public may ask questions. Keeping in mind, this is not the time to hear objections but rather an opportunity to gather information on the proposal. A motion would be in order to refer the proposed rezoning application to a public hearing, PAC, and that notice be issued to property owners with, within 100 meter radius of the property proposed for rezoning in accordance with rezoning schedule. So that is the procedure that we will follow this evening. We will do it respectfully and I will now request that Mr. Cipolla, you come to the podium. Please give your name for the clerk. What I'm looking for, Mr. Cipolla, is just to tell me where you want the rezoning done, and, uh, and then we'll ask you to sit down and we'll take any questions. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity, Mayor and Council. I basically, <clears throat> all I'm asking for is additional parking for staff parking, so it'd be more convenient for the residents of, uh, of the valley, um, get them closer parking to everybody's door in the strip mall, etc. So I'm asking for park additional parking and um, a storage shed to store the equipment from our patio and then a few other things that belong to Amici's business. It, uh, it's not, the shed's not for everybody. The shed will be for our private use and, and the, the parking, and that's it. I'm not asking for anything more. Okay, thank you very much. At this time, uh, I will ask Council if you have any questions or concerns at this point, uh, or if you would like to make a motion. <coughs> Are there any comments from the public? The idea here is to gather information. Just one second. This is not the time to hear objections, but rather an opportunity to gather information on the proposal. So if you have information that you would like to give, Mr. Cipolla will be seated and you can come to the podium, give your name and your comment. Thank you, Mr. Cipolla. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll go to Councillor Bigger first. Thank you, Your Worship. I just want to say, is the microphone on the podium for the sake of people that are using it? I don't see it sort of sticking up, but maybe it's, it's just out of sight. Okay, just wanted to be sure. Thank you. Yes, sir. Good evening. Could you please give your name? Stuart Hook, 10 Leiden Drive. Thank you. My question is, um, will a precedent be set uh, in, um, with making a, um, a commercial lot 
in between two houses uh, in a residential subdivision. Thank you. Within the Community Planning Act, any property that abuts on a highway or provincial road, such as the Hampton Road, that is well within the Community Planning Act to change from R1, R2 to a CC2 Central Commercial. So it's not a precedent, it's part of the Community Planning Act. I'm looking now for a, is there anyone else that would like to speak? Yes, please give your name for the clerk. My name is Trinda Carvel. Um, I just wanted to ask about what you just mentioned because the lot on Leiden Drive is not on the Hampton Road. Yes, you're correct, but this property is not going to exit on Leiden Drive, it's going to exit on the, uh, on the highway. So it's because of the exit? It, that's correct. Okay, and, and then I just wanted to be clear, um, the parking is just for staff, is that right? It's not for patrons? My understanding, I'll let Mr. Cipolla come back and answer any of the concerns or questions. My understanding from what Mr. Cipolla said is that it's for staff parking so that the, uh, I th believe he said the tenant or the um, visitors to the mall itself could have the parking places out front, I believe is what he said, and his uh, employees and the employees of the other businesses in the mall would park out back. But okay. I will have him clarify okay. that. And then all the recommendations that were made by the PAC, will those all be taken into consideration too? The recommendations will go before uh, the engineers here in the town office and there'll be a developer's agreement that will meet all of the recommendations from PAC. Okay. So whatever PAC furthers to the engineering department, they will be uh, considering those. Okay, and will we have a chance to see those before the April public hearing? I really don't know. There's a public hearing. Uh, Jennifer, would you? Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. Um, we actually received engineer drawings for the parking lot at 3.30 this afternoon. We haven't had a chance to review as staff, but uh, they will be part of the public record once they're presented at the public hearing. I'd have to check with the development officer if I would be able to release those prior to that. First time I've been involved in this process, so I just wondered how we can make objections if we don't even know what the plan is. You would have that, um, the package is issued on Monday to the public, so our meetings are on Tuesday, so you can that's the procedure. Sure. Through, through you, Your Worship, depending on Council's motion this evening, uh, the residents will be notified and the plan would accompany that notification. So members do have, um, they do see the plan and have opportunity to submit written objections and can attend the public hearing and either support or oppose the proposed rezoning day before or is there um, some sort of protocol that says we receive it a week before or 10 days before or anything like that? Try to get the notification out like if council passes the motion this evening it, they will likely go out this week. Okay thank you. Okay. So that will certainly give ample time Ms. Carvel. Councillor Olson. Thank you your worship. Uh, I would move that Council set a public hearing date for April 18th, 2023 and direct notice to be sent to property owners within a 100 meter radius of property proposed for rezoning. Thank you. It's been moved by Councillor Olson, seconded by Councillor Bigger on the question. Deputy Mayor Scryer. Uh, yes, Your Worship, would it be appropriate at this time for Council to ask questions of the proponent? On the question, uh, did you want to ask Mr. Cipolla? Yes, I just I wanted to ask about the buffer. Okay, Mr. Cipolla, would you please come back to the podium? Thank First you. of all, I'd like to apologize for not getting 
uh, the plan in sooner. The engineer has been quite busy, and he said he'll have it completed possibly by the by the end of the week, first of next week. You'll have all the changes and everything all finished up, so you'll have it soon. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, Mr. Cipolla, so the buffer, um, I know that it's been changed. The PAC has um, recommended that the buffer be 30 feet, I think it is. So will that be 30 feet on on Leiden and the sides of the properties? Yes. So starting on Leiden, all three sides will be 30 feet. Okay. And will there be additional landscaping put in to that buffer? Yes, okay, and my final... Uh, as far as um, the property right now, do you know if that property is used for um, by residents to as um, a shortcut? Etc. And uh, but anyway, hopefully that'll stop once we put a what do you call it? Build, build the land, the berm, build the land up. Plant more trees. Hopefully, that'll it'll discourage them. And any plans for fencing? I'm sorry. Any plans for fencing? Uh, not at this time. We're not because I'm not considering a fence. Okay. And my last question is just, um, if you, your worship, thank you. Is the is, there will be no exit or entrance off no, of Leiden? There'll be no 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 way in or out. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. On the question, the motion's been moved by Councillor Olson, seconded by Councillor Bigger. On the question, seeing there are none, please vote now. Motion carried 7 0. Thank you for being here this evening, those involved in that particular presentation. Item B, our next presentation is with the Fundy Regional Service Commission. And as mayor of Quispam Sis, I am a member of the board of directors of the commission. And I have observed how the new local governance reform agenda has impacted local governments across the region, as well as the Regional Service Commission. The process to introduce these reforms have not been without its bumps and conflict points but the majority of the new reforms are now complete and the board of directors of the commission has committed to making the best of our new reality and to strive to deliver new value for local government and the Fundy region through these new reforms. We cannot change what has occurred in the past, but we are now in charge of forging our future as a Fundy region. I would like to introduce the commission's chief executive officer, Phil Wallet who started his role in October of 2022, Phil has 15 years of experience working in the public sector. He reports directly to the board of directors of the commission and as part of the recently adopted 2023 FRSC work plan, the board has requested that he present to each local municipal government on the commission's new mandate and what to expect in 2023. Phil, it's a pleasure to have you here this evening, and the podium is yours. Great. Thank you very much, um, um, Mayor O'Hara, and thank you for having me here this evening. It's a great opportunity to share a little bit about the commission and uh, where we're headed uh, this year. You can change slide. Um, uh, what is uh, the commission? What is the Regional Service Commission? It is not uh, local government and it is not the government of New Brunswick. It is a service provider with legislative mandates from the province uh, for the benefit of the seven members it represents, as well as for the residents of the Fundy region. As of January 1st of this year, uh, things have changed for the commission, both in terms of geography and what we do, which is consistent with a lot of the local governments in our region as well. Next slide. 
the commission is managed uh, by a board of directors comprised of representatives from each of the seven communities. Here they are on the slide now. Change slide. The FRSC, uh, which is the, the Funding Regional Service Commission, has been in place for 10 years. So this is not a new commission. It's just an expanded mandate for the commission. And what I would um, quantify is that the commission does have a, 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 an important history and track record of providing uh, quality public service for the region. Next slide. So uh, this is where things change. Um, uh, when we first started 10 years ago, uh, we had two responsibilities, a solid waste uh, commission out at Crane Mountain, uh, as well as uh, local planning. And as of January 1st of this year, uh, things have expanded quite a bit. And the one point that I would make is that nothing in our new mandate uh, of the commission is expected or intended to duplicate. There can be things that occur at a local level and concurrently something that happens at the regional level. It does not mean that one is replacing or duplicating the other. It is simply an accelerator or a different uh, phase of that particular mandate. Next slide. So this slide's got a lot of colors, um, and uh, this is our budget broken down by the various services we have. So um, everything in green I would call uh, matured or pre-existing services. These are all services that were already in place, already in place. Uh, they have a history. They have matured uh, for, for different reasons. Some of them are new, um, and uh, they tend to have higher uh, price tags to them because they have a history, they've evolved, uh, they've progressed. Things in light blue are those services that are brand new, and we're still investigating how to bring value, how to identify what uh, a regional approach are them. The purple one is a little bit of both. Uh, there's a history to regional facilities and there's also a future to regional facilities. Uh, so that one is unique uh, in that sense. Uh, next slide. Uh, what I'll do now is go through each one of the new services and provide a little bit of oversight of what they mean and what they're all about. And then uh, from there, we'll, we'll go through our work plan and uh, uh, offer an opportunity for questions. The first is economic development and tourism promotion. They're two separate mandates. Uh, but for the Fundy region, uh, they are fused together under our relationship with Envision St. John. And for the Fundy region, we're a little bit ahead of the curve uh, in comparison to the other 12 regional service commissions across the province who are all trying to figure out regional economic and tourism uh, promotion. Uh, and in addition, we already have our key performance indicators and strategic plan for uh, that mandate through Envision St. John. So we're that much more ahead of the curve uh, in this one. Next slide is uh, regional facilities. And um, uh, there are two primary categories to regional facilities, the existing facilities and then new facilities. So by legislation, the province assigned this regional service commission uh, the five pre-existing regional facilities um, through the Regional Facilities Commission Act. So those are TD Station, Aquatic Center, uh, the St. John Art Center, Imperial uh, Theater, as well as the St. John Trade and Convention Center. So of these existing facilities, the role of the commission will be to receive applications on an annual basis uh, from these facilities for operating and capital costs. The capital is new. Uh, operating was uh, what was the pre-existing commission. Uh, in addition, uh, encourage usage uh, and, uh, and to drive success for those facilities. The other responsibility of this mandate is new facilities, how we will go about identifying new regional facilities in the future. And that will include medium <coughs> and long-term planning on the needs for a recreation, sport, and culture facilities in, in our region, uh, as well as the definition of whether they're going to be partially regional or fully regional uh, as well. So we'll move on to the next slide. The broadest mandate uh, that we've received is this uh, uh, mandate called community development. As of today, it includes social inclusion, newcomer settlement, and diversity promotion, affordable housing, and healthy communities. And as of 2024, the province has shared its uh, intention to include poverty reduction, mental health, uh, as well as homelessness. And um, uh, you know, there's certainly differences across the region as it relates to socioeconomic outcomes of our communities. I think that can be stated. However, there are common threads across our entire region uh, as it relates to these facets. Every community faces poverty. Every community right now in the Fundy region across the province is facing challenges with the unaffordability of housing. 
Every community in New Brunswick is facing challenges with racism. Every community is seeking uh, to make their community inclusive. That is just, just common threads. So one of the themes here is to identify how we will work together to achieve those outcomes as a region, and certainly to support those that are the most mar marginalized and vulnerable uh, in our region. Next slide is uh, regional transportation. And uh, this is uh, you know, uh, a mandate to really identify how uh, we can work together as a region for the mobility uh, and linkages of uh, the transportation of goods and people across our, our region. And just as a quick example, uh, for those of you who <coughs> hike or run, uh, you, you see all these beautiful trails across the entire region that uh, is across each local government. But we might ask ourselves, how do they link up? How, how are they, uh, how do they connect with each other? And how could we look at those in a new way to provide greater value for the value proposition of our region, as well as for uh, the services and uh, the experience for those who use them? Next slide is uh, regional public safety. Uh, for those of you who don't know, there are over 35 different public safety stakeholders in the Fundy region. And uh, we will have a, um, a responsibility of identifying any opportunities to work together as a region to identify risks and threats and opportunities uh, to, to offer stronger public safety support uh, for the residents across uh, the region. So our 2023 uh, work plan, this is the next slide. Um, a couple themes here. One of the themes that you might have already uh, found through what I've shared so far is let's focus on what unites us. Um, there's a things that do divide us as a, as a region, but let's identify those things that everybody can nod their head and say, that makes good sense. We should be working together on that. Um, the commission is, is poised to dive into 2023 uh, to bring value to uh, these mandates uh, across all the local governments. And uh, the Board of Directors has made it a priority to speak uh, in one voice on commission matters. Uh, the next slide, I have not shared with you a detailed breakdown of our work plan, but there are 46 different projects in 2023 uh, for uh, the commission's work plan that was adopted on uh, February 16th. Um, one that I did want to identify is the regional strategy. So the province has decided to mandate the completion of that by J July 1st. Uh, it is a quick turnaround, but we will be engaging immediately. The councils of each one of the local governments are part of that engagement, and we'll hope to get your feedback over the coming weeks and months uh, for that. And uh, that will be an opportunity to identify our five-year plans, our focus, our priorities for a lot of these new mandates, um, and to invite a broader community into this mandate uh, as well and get their perspective. Next slide, uh, this runs through a little bit of what we've been up to and what we've uh, achieved so far. And you know, one of the things that uh, is, is indicative of the work is that we've established committees uh, and those committees are being stood up uh, as we speak uh, and uh, each one of those new mandates will have that. The other thing I wanted to identify is the relationship with the government of New Brunswick. Um, and this is really important because this local governance reform agenda has left a lot of people still scratching their head. They're still trying to figure out what it means, how to interpret it, how to react to it, how to live with it. So there's constant communication between the commission and the government of Brunswick for that. There's also advocacy between uh, the commission and the, and the government of New Brunswick. And certainly the third topic is identifying funding opportunities with the province to alleviate the costs that would be uh, off of the, uh, the membership fees of the members of the commission. Uh, I have a little timeline here uh, at the end uh, to explain just some of the key next steps that uh, you may um, follow along on. So in April, I suspect we will have our first committee meetings, the inaugural meetings for those new uh, mandates. Um, and uh, that will be a great opportunity to get those committees going. It will also start off our, our kickoff for the engagement uh, for the regional strategy. Um, and by July, again, we'll be trying to complete that. By um, 2024, uh, the idea is that those committees will be reviewed and we'll also be looking into that social mandate that the province has identified and how we'll uh, cope with that. Um, that is it. I am available for any questions if there are any. Thank you very much, Mr. Willett. Uh, certainly lots of new things going on under this new mandate and uh, it's exciting to be a part of it. And uh, certainly I hope that the region is aware that as you've already mentioned, where our area is way ahead of the curve when we look around the province. So uh, we've got 
one leg up, I guess, on, on other areas. So if there are any questions or comments from the council, certainly uh, happy to entertain those. Deputy Mayor Scryer. Thank you very much, and thank you for your presentation, and congratulations on your new role, a challenging role at that. Um, so uh, my question is about the committees, the new um, community committee, I believe you call it community, um, that's going to roll out in 220, 2024. You mentioned homelessness, but you will housing also fall under that committee, or is housing going to stay with the province of New Brunswick under the new housing corp? And how do you see that coming about? Uh, through the mayor to the councillor, um, it's a great question. Um, I think the the simplest way that I the, the way I'd answer it is um, the the province does require to clarify some of the roles and responsibilities, especially around province service commissions as well as local governments. Um, and the idea would be what opportunities are there for uh, the region to come together on that for our mandate. So it may be an example of, and I'm just giving an example here, but uh, it could be that uh, several communities are interested in supporting affordable housing, but they're not quite sure how, and they might not have the resources to support a full program or a full staff to do it. Now, could the commission play a role to support that and provide support across the entire region? Perhaps that could be an area. Um, housing and affordable housing is part of the mandate uh, in terms of what what that means, we're still waiting for a little bit more detail. Um, I think uh, this regional strategy will be an opportunity to define what that exactly looks like and what the community is really looking for from a regional lens on support in that area. And I'll just make one clear clarification. The Community Development Committee will be uh, stood up this year uh, and it will grow into this future mandate which will encompass these other homelessness, uh, uh, mental health and, uh, and poverty reduction. Thank you for the question, Deputy Mayor. I'm just going to go to Councillor Miller and then I'll come back to you. Thank you, Worship. Thank you, Mr. Lett, for, for coming and uh, congratulations on the new role. So um, I do have some questions. Though, so I know you can't change what's happened in the past, uh, but there's just a, a couple of concerns that I've seen that has happened in the past where, um, as an example, capital for the regional things. So there's two, two issues with capital, but first I'll get into one. There's contracts that have been signed by the City of St. John that we had nothing to do with, whether it's with Trade and Convention Center or recently with the TD station. So just quickly on the TD station that just got signed, was the commission involved in any of those discussions or was that just all of St. John? And what does that mean to us? <laughs> uh, through the mayor to the councillor, um, a great question. Um, uh, perhaps the starting point to this is to identify the different players involved. So. Um, um, the commission is one player, and our, and our responsibility is to receive proposals on an annual basis for capital and operating, which we have the right to revisit, we can push back, we can ask questions, we can, we can refuse, we can do all that stuff. In addition to that, there are owners of these facilities. Four of those are owned by the City of St. John, one is owned uh, privately, the Imperial. And they also have a role as well. Uh, in addition, there's two other major categories of players. The boards of each one of these facilities, which I understand a, each local government has a representative that is present on those committees, uh, and in addition to that, the staff who operate it. So there's a lot of different players in this space. Uh, on this particular one, I understand that that was a decision made by the the commissions, uh, by the um, by the TG stations committee or, or board, um, and. Um, and uh, there was an update recently provided to the city to uh, some regional administrative representatives. Uh, so that was not uh, there. Um, in the event there was a decision that was gonna have a higher than expected uh, operating cost per se on the, the region due to a decision made, I think that would invite a conversation to say this should be discussed at a regional level. I don't understand that being the case for this. Um, and that would certainly be a high priority item for the future committee uh, to say, is this going to cost us more, and uh, should we be briefed on it in that case? So in this case, I'm, I'm, I don't believe that was the intention at all. Uh, but I do think that those different roles and responsibilities will become much clearer as we progress through this new, uh, this new course for the commission and uh, the regional facilities. 
Sure. And the, the reason I'm getting at that is because trade and convention centers like a million dollars a year, and we're always told, well, they signed it, we can't change it, but we get caught for it. But when I look at the capital, uh, and uh, these are all numbers provided to me by the city of St. John. So I, they had sent their five previous years to, to the groups. So as an example, those five, <coughs> five facilities that we're talking about, five years prior, the average capital was $702,000 for all five combined. That was the annual average for the five years prior to this new <coughs> commission or, or happening. The next five years, the average is 2.4 million. So it's a three times triple, threefold. So Aquatic Center had nothing in 2021, 2022. <coughs> now it's 1.1 million just for the Aquatic Center this year. So kind of just seems a timing little suspect. So my, my question is that's done for this year or is it? But if I look at what's going on for the rest of the year, if some region has not looked after the capital, and I'll speak um, my opinion first on, uh, if I look at Quiz Fam, it's a cuplex. We continually update it, we put in LED lights, we make sure everything's there. We spend lots of money every year, and I could argue with you or the board that it's probably more regional facility than some of the other ones. It, you know, we, we do the under 18s, we do Jeux de Francophonie, we do Skate Canada, we do all that stuff here, and we keep it up to date. We do that with the QMA as well, where most of our regional guys aren't doing that. So I, I have a tough time paying for their capital that they haven't kept up. So it's just something to look out for. You can't change what happened in the past, but it seems suspect to me that all of a sudden it goes up threefold and nothing was happening before, and now we get the charge. And, and we've been doing our due diligence in our infrastructure, um, and maybe they, you couldn't for whatever reason. I get it, but it just I'm just looking at the numbers, and that's what it showed before, and that's what it shows after. So that's a bit of a concern, and and... A quick question, because I know there's been a whole bunch of discussion in Trade and Convention Center, because I think we're the only region that has a Trade and Convention Center, and that was kept there by, by the minister himself, is can we get a copy of what the other regions have as far as regional facilities? Because I've done some research on some of them, but I don't have a full copy and what they're paying. So it, it'd just be nice to know, because I'm more in the numbers, looking at the numbers, and I'm also uh, chairman of the Finance Committee, too. But it's it, these are things that I... I Anyways, that I just looked at, so. Councillor Miller, great points. Uh, I think the, the uh, I'll just give, make two points here. First, I think the rigor of this committee is gonna be fairly substantive. Um, we have clarity on what we're looking for, for budget proposals for, for operating, budget proposals for capital. They'll be happening at the same time, uh, which is unique so that you can see whether uh, you, you don't invest in the capital, what impact that will have on your operating budget and vice versa. <laughs> um, and it will be comprised of, uh, at least as the, the draft terms of reference now, is that it may be comprised of administrators from each one of the communities in addition to board members. So a much more rigorous approach uh, to that. Um, and for new applications for new facilities, the optimism I have is that just there on that committee level as well. So the same questions of is the asset management up to par? Are you investing accurately? I think those are great questions to be asked, and I suspect the owners of those facilities will, will have good answers to respond when they, when they come forward. Uh, the only other point I wanted to make is those five facilities were really the provincial government's vision. Uh, they were mandated to us. Uh, there was not much... Uh, um, uh, input, there was, offer, there was offerance from the commission to provide some guidance on especially the Trade and Convention Center and the province uh, indicated its, its continued preference to have all five and uh, that is now in the legislation and uh, we will do the best that we can with that. Thank you. And Deputy Mayor, did you want to follow up? Thank you, Your Worship. I, I did on the community committee. Um, as we know, when we're talking about the community committee, we're talking a lot about the social determinants of health, um, whether it's housing, poverty, um, mental health. And there's been a lot of work in the greater St. John and in the province on, uh, on a lot of these issues. And I, I'd hate to see repetition, 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 and no action. So my question is, besides the maybe committee, what role will Horizon play? What role will social development play? What role will uh, 
who else is there, education play in making sure or bringing their knowledge and their assets and their financial assets to the table as well uh, because the communities such as ours have, you know, we do have um, um, programs that we support and to allow for accessibility um, for financial barriers to be broken down. However, we have never had the mandate to, the money for the mandate to provide more. So I just want to make sure that there's going to be um, financial money brought to the table for any of these programming. Uh, through, uh, uh, through the mayor to uh, Councillor Schreier, um, uh, from my understanding, the province is not intending to vacate these responsibilities. Uh, so it's more of an accelerator, uh, a support. So um, uh, I think your point is is a good one. Uh, what types of financial supports can the province provide uh, for these new services? I, I don't think it is a full. You know, uh, people have used the word downloading. That is that's certainly not the vision that I've heard. That you know, you're going to be now the full responsibility of mental health uh, in the, in the province, and we're going to be vacating that responsibility. It's more. I think the vision here is that. Can we identify priorities from a regional perspective, uh, not all centralized out of a Fredericton you know, government office, that what priorities can we identify for these themes as a regional basis? And in turn, from the community, which I've heard you know, very favorable, is there is no other entity in the region um, that brings together the mayors or deputy mayors of each one of our local governments with an expectation for recommendations to come forward on these. So you know, if you were one of these organizations that had a great idea about how you might mobilize it, you'd have to be knocking on seven different local government doors to say, this is my idea, could we work together? You'd have to get the province involved. Now you've got one. You've got this committee, you've got this mandate, and you've got um, mayors and deputy mayors across the region sitting at this commission saying, what can I do to help and how can we make this work? Uh, so I think that's the real opportunity from a community perspective uh, that uh, that has really, at least I've heard, as, as a resounding interest uh, for that. Thank you. And anyone else like to ask any questions of the CEO of the Fundy Regional Service Commission? And I think one of the things that you mentioned at the very beginning was that um, we're constantly seeking funding uh, from the government. So looking for that support for everything that we do under this new mandate. So I think that's extremely important. Uh, Councillor Olson. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I think the agenda is massive. It's scary. Uh, in the meantime, we're trying to organize and operate a community. And I don't know how some of the other members in our community, in our overall region, is going to be able to match our potential for involvement and participation. Um, taking on uh, uh, a lot of the items that are on the agenda, I think are uh, I think it's uh, it's an unknown uh, commodity. Uh, we've got no uh, funding for it right now. It appears to be downloading from the province. Some of these things that we're being asked to take on, there are whole departments in the provincial government that handle what we're being requested to initiate somehow within our own community and then support in another uh, one of seven or eight communities in the whole region. Myself, I've been here a long time and, uh, and we've all put a lot of time into uh, operating and, uh, and uh, uh, funding uh, our own community at the request of our residents with the support of our residents and uh, here we are we've got a uh, the cuplex that was built and opened in 2011 we financed that ourselves with uh, three million from the province and the uh, and the feds f uh, each for six million when the gar salon was built they had 7.2 each that's 14.4 they received for their arena similar to ours uh, the um, uh, in uh, the when they built the uh, uh, facility in uh, Dieppe, uh, they got something like 18 or 19 million for a 32 million dollar project. So it's it's horrendous, and uh, I don't want to sound too uh, uh, too negative, but I just I just wonder where all of the energy 
and the time is going to come from to completely maintain what we've created and uh, have sold to our community here in Quispam Sis, and then uh, reinforce uh, that uh, that philosophy, I, I guess, with everybody else in the Regional Service Commission, because a lot of them don't have the same resources that we presently have right now, but we are contributing. Uh, we will be uh, asked to contribute uh, on, a, on a per capita basis, probably, with some financial input from the province, but I, I don't think it's going to be nearly enough to recognize what we've accomplished and what we're being asked to accomplish. And I would look to, and I would like to think that we've been, that we're one of the more progressive communities in the whole region, and uh, we're. we're we're fortunate to have our mayor as a chair, which, and I don't really know how she's going to be able to do everything that she's going to be expected to take care of on behalf of the whole region when she's got a major responsibility right here in Quist Pam says with a population of 19,000 people and a tax rate that we've been proud to keep very reasonable. And I can't see it, I can see a jump in 10 cents just to accomplish all this other stuff that's going on here. So, uh, uh, I, I guess I'm, I, I don't know where it's all going to go, how it's going to go, and a lot of it has uh, tight timelines for uh, to get this achieved. I've heard uh, uh, it's all going to be accomplished by July 1st. That's three and a half months from now. I mean, I, I just can't even imagine it when they're starting their first committee meeting in April. And, you know, it doesn't, to me, it doesn't make sense. Okay, so I'm, uh, I'm willing to listen, and I'll be watching very closely how things develop. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Olson. Councillor Miller. Thank you, Worship. Um, and I, I do wish, wish you the best, and I'll be, I'll be watching like Council. We'll all be watching. But um, I guess a suggestion, though, for your future meetings, that, which would be really nice. So if you're not aware, everything you're doing here is recorded. It's on YouTube. It'll stay there forever so people can see what's happened. Um, with this commission... I would like to see that we have minutes sent to us so that we know what's going on. It'd be nice to see have it virtual so that you could attend if you want to be in the open sessions. Um, it, it's just the, and that you could even have virtual meetings because uh, I look at, uh, and I only know a very small amount, to be fair, on what uh, the amount of time our acting CEO and, and our mayor have spent. And I know the amount of time the whole group has spent because I heard a lot of stuff over the last six, seven months. And when you talk about deadlines, getting emails on a Friday, it's got to be ready for Monday. Come on, I, I know it's not your fault, but it, it's got to work. Like, it, it's got to make sense. So I'm very concerned, too, with the amount of time that if you're trying to get everything done by July, our mayor and CAO should also be focusing here primarily, but you're going to have lots of meetings and requests and calls, and they're going to be somewhere on the other side of town that's going to take 35 minutes to drive, 45, 45 minutes or whatever each way is. Doing things virtually would be great. Um, I'm concerned at the amount of time that you're going to take away from major key contributors to our town as well. Um, because don't take this wrong, that's your number one priority, but may not be my number one priority. It's to get this town running and continued as is. So you're taking a lot of time from our group to go out there. And if, you're, if it's accomplished something, great. And uh, just a quick antidote, we had somebody do a ring study here, and I won't give the person's name because they're still there, but but took a year and a half to do a ring study to come back and there was still no result and it was said well maybe you should hire a consultant so we can't waste time just because we, you don't get the right answer we want so and sometimes the bigger commit the committees the longer it takes sometimes you shouldn't have 18 people on a committee or 14 people you have six you have three and maybe it's not people in different communities put the right people in the right job it doesn't matter where you're from if you're an expert in that field you go there not because we need somebody from every different whatever um it's just, I'm a little leery because I know you're saying it's not, we got, we're adding, to me, we're adding another layer of government and extra work for our staff and, and our mayor and potentially us too. So it, I'm just worried about the downloading of, of work and costs, but it's also, um, yeah, mm -hmm. I'll wait and see. But back to the thing, I think you should do as much virtual as you can. It should be accessible to the public if you're having a public meeting and there should be minutes sent out and, and potentially... I don't know. I think most town councils now, I'm just looking there, I think everybody's on YouTube or Rogers or something. So it's, uh, 
know, j just comments to, to go through because I am concerned with the amount of time that our mayor and staff will have to spend, especially if you want to cram everything into three months. You can have a meeting every day, but it's kind of hard for our mayor to also be there every day. But being chairman, she's going to have to be. So that's, or maybe you don't have to be, but you're expected to be. <laughs> so thanks. Through the mayor or to uh, Councillor uh, Miller as well as to Councillor Olson's comments, I think they're both uh, very astute, very uh, very important comments to hear, and uh, certainly not the only ones that feel that way in the region. Um, I just make two two comments to it. One is uh, I think you're absolutely right. We have to be very cautious around the time that uh, people have to support this, um, and I think it comes down to value. This has to be valuable. We have to make this valuable. Um, so that's for the representatives of the committee, for local governments to say, let's make this valuable for the time, for the people that are going to participate, and also the outcomes that we're driving. So if I were to say, um, if we work together as a region, we could hire you know, one firm and save 20% for everybody on whatever we do, that sounds pretty good. Sounds like a good idea. That's good value. Well, that's what we should be striving for. Right? But that's good value. That's when we identify good value. And sometimes good value will also cost us money, uh, but it brings value to everybody. So I think the, the idea is to bring these issues. It's not to reduce what's happening at the local level. It's to identify the opportunities at the regional level that will really bring value to all the members. Uh, so it's not to come in and say, everybody now who's doing anything related to policing or fire need to come through us. Absolutely not. It's only when it comes to the value proposition for bringing it regional. Thank you very much, Mr. Willett, and thank you, uh, councillors, for your questions and for your concern for the uh, staff and myself. And uh, you're absolutely right that this is a, a, a lot of different mandates now that we have that we didn't have post-January 1st or, or pre-January 1st, 2023. So, uh, so yes, the work, the scope of the work has certainly increased and, uh, you know, as mentioned, we're going to make the best of it and uh, just hope that we make this all work and come out on the other side. So uh, I would like someone to make a motion, please. Councillor Miller. I would like to thank Mr. Uh, Phil for the informative presentation and updating the members and of the new mandates of the Regional Service Council and wish you all the best. Thank you. It's been moved by Councillor Miller, seconded by. Councillor Thompson on the question. Please vote now. Motion carried unanimously. Thank you very much, Mr. Roulette, and uh, we look forward to hearing good news down the road. Thanks very much. Our next item. Oh. Sorry. Yeah, I just have a question. Um, the original, whether 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 I have a conflict or not, the original presentation for the bees, I wasn't at public hearing, but since this is another one, am I disqualified or not? Okay. I just want to make sure because I missed the first one or the one last year I wasn't at. Okay, thanks. Sorry. Thank you for bringing that to our attention, Councillor Miller. Our next item is a public hearing. Proposed zoning bylaw amendment number 038-37 re-regulating apiary operations beekeeping. And we have representing our town this evening, planning technologist Jennifer Jarvis. And Jennifer, I'm just going to read the uh, public hearing procedure. So we acknowledge that this evening has been set aside to consider amending zoning bylaw number 38 and that this day and place is, has been chosen for a public hearing. Note that anyone wishing to speak for or against the proposed amendment will be heard and considered by council. Each person wishing to speak will approach the podium, 
identify themselves and have five minute timeline to address council. So first we will hear the proponent, then we will hear those wishing to speak for or against the proposal and shall be given the opportunity to be heard. I will then ask three times if anyone further wishes to speak for or against the proposed amendments. The proponent may make a final summation. PAC's written views will be read. Council members may be asked, council members may ask questions. And item number seven, a motion may be presented and voted upon. So Ms. Jarvis, if you would like to go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. So I have a presentation this evening regarding the uh, fee bylaw. Um, <laughs> I had a little fun making it. So the introduction, uh, this is, will be a review of an introduction uh, to the provisions to regulate hobby beekeeping in, what? <laughs> oh, there we go. Introduction to provisions to regulate apiaries in Chris Pampsis. Provide definitions for the following. Beehive, beekeeping, hobby beekeeping, and nuisance. And also, we will be taking this opportunity to do a little administrative work and uh, revise the section 26 of the zoning bylaw to provide clarity regarding offenses and penalties. So, council instructed staff in April of 2021, I believe it was, to provide a draft amendment to regulate apiary operations uh, within the municipality. And the, these uh, provisions were to include zones where the hobby beekeeping is permitted, lot sizes and setback requirements, number of beehives permitted on a lot, and ensure best practices are being followed. Currently, the town has no mechanism to respond to any complaints <coughs> regarding beekeeping in Quispan Sis. And if approved, this amendment will provide staff a mechanism to manage hobby beekeeping within the municipal boundary. So some interesting facts about bees and beekeeping. Um, so historically speaking, this has been going on for many, 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 many years. The history dates back to prehistoric times. So rock painting in Spain dating back to 9,000 BCE is the earliest representation of, hop of beekeeping in the world. And who knows, they might, fi might find something even earlier. Um, beekeeping is like unlike any other practice of agriculture or husbandry in that the whole idea is for the animal to actually leave the area to go and forage and not like a, an ordinary um, animal that you would keep within your, your boundary. One pound of honey is equal to 55,000 kilometers of flying. So if you add up all the bees and all their distances, that's what it takes uh, to make one pound of honey. A bee will visit 1,500 flowers for one load of pollen, and approximately a third of the world's food is a result of pollinating insects like honeybees. So what's changed in the zoning bylaw for this presentation compared to the one that was brought forward last year? Well, we've removed the requirement uh, to go before PAC for a hobby beekeeper in a residential area. So an <coughs> R1, or an RU zone, if you're following all the provisions, you, you will not be required to go forward to the Planning Advisory Committee. Uh, we have increased working with the, with the people in the beekeeping uh, industry. <laughs> uh, Mr. Colburn and I sat down and, and met with them and had a much better understanding of the life cycle of bees and, and how the hives grow throughout a season and the requirement for extra beehives what is, was realized, and so we've increased the number from allowing two beehives in a residential area, R1, <coughs> to four. And in the RU zone, we have increased it from four to eight. That, and the RU zone, it would have to be on a lot 4,000 square meters or larger. 
We've removed the requirement for the liability insurance as um, we researched this and found that it was something that was uh, going to be most impossible to find because it was hobby beekeeping and not commercial beekeeping. Um, and we have included a definition of nuisance, sort of balancing out um, the what we need for beekeepers and what we need for our residents. So uh, with that, I will open the floor to any questions. Thank you for that information and background. I will open the floor to council to uh, ask any questions of Ms. Jarvis, our planning technologist. Okay. I'm going to revert this order. I'm going to first go to the audience and ask if there is anyone sitting in the audience who would like to speak for or against this amendment. I will ask three times. If you would like to speak, please come to the podium and give your name to the clerk. After three times I ask, I will go to council and you will have uh, forfeited your ability to ask. So I'm going to ask again. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak for or against? Would you please come to the podium? And when this person is finished, would you please come up so that I'll know that there is somebody else? Good evening. Good evening, Your would Worship you, and members of council. Thank you for being here. Would you please give your name to the clerk? My name is Faye Frazier, and I live on Cedar Grove Drive, right on the lakeside. And we've built this house uh, 27 years ago and have loved it every year until last year. And, you know, we all look forward to summer coming and spring coming. Well, that has changed with the number of hives that are there. So I'm saying that I'm for the um, amendment of uh, two to four hives, and, and I really appreciate the nuisance clause that's there, too. Because we all know that um, if we had a cat or a dog that was causing a problem in somebody's property and they wouldn't do anything about it, then you know we'd have to we'd be taken to task about that animal. So the other thing that I would like to say too is all of these hives, 12 or 13, I'm not sure, I've never been on the property, so it's just an estimate. All these hives hold 60 to 80,000 bees per hive. And that's a lot of flying over my house. And they're going to the lake. And I appreciate the fact that the council uh, was going to uh, insist that a water source um, be available to these bees right on their own property. And like I said, I appreciate the nuisance clause in case that doesn't work. I'm just praying that it does because I can't hang out clothes. I can't eat outside. My new deck furniture has got bees uh, defecating all over it. And, um, and it just uh, makes me sad that this place that I've enjoyed right on the lake for so long is now not enjoyable to be outside. So I thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Frazier. Good evening, welcome. Thank you. Please give your name to the clerk. Jocelyn Smith, your worship, councillors, thank you very much. Um, just wanted to thank everybody's uh, time that they spent uh, working on this issue. We're in year two now, um, so it's it's been a challenge. As uh, uh, Faye also spoke, we live on Cedar Grove Drive as well. Many of the things that she has endured, we have endured ourselves. Um, while we are very hopeful for success with these uh, new amendments, I think we also have to think about the possibility of failure, and uh, not everybody follows the rules all the time. Um, and I do think that this nuisance clause does allow uh, a little recourse for the citizens that are living um, in that area. Um, my concern, though, is that there's nothing specific to uh, a penalty in regards to the nuisance component. Um, there is, of course, in the uh, section 26, offenses and penalties, there is a fine that can be levied against someone who is not following the rules. 
of the bylaw, but I'm asking the council to consider that if uh, the beekeeper is indeed found that these, uh, there is a nuisance, um, that that beekeeper, um, if they are found to be a nuisance as deemed by, I can't remember, it's section 5, 63.1, um, that they actually be required to remove the bees from the property. Um, I don't think that a fine in that case is going to be enough. So that would be my only concern. Otherwise, we are very hopeful that the bylaw will uh, sort of uh, complement both the citizens and the hobby beekeepers. So I thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Ms. Smith. Is there anyone else who would like to speak for or against this amendment? Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to speak for or against this amendment? This will be the final time that I will ask. Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to speak for or against this amendment? Seeing there are none, I will now turn to counsel for your questions. And uh, they will be directed to Ms. Jarvie. Deputy Mayor Scryer. Thank you, Your Worship always the way when you're trying to get your hands on it right at the moment you can't find it but I did write it down so it has to do with the bylaw and I have section 6 EED um, um, it talks about the uh, it can be in, in um, residential R1 R2 and um, rural but then it goes on to say all other considerations for hobby beekeeping must be approved by PAC what what exactly is that? What would all other considerations be? Uh, I would direct you to 6EE1, where it indicates that hobby beekeeping is permitted in any zone. So if the school decides that they would like to run a program for beekeeping with the students on the campus, we would invite them to PAC to ask for approval at that point or if um, somebody in the commercial district wished to have a bee, some bees on their property uh, that's happening in Rossay actually, I think in the commons area, there's uh, beekeeping on a rooftop. So it's just in case of, of those requests came through. So we've allowed hobby beekeeping in the regular places that would be someone's backyard, but we've also taken into consideration that they should be allowed in other zones um, but if they are, then they would have to come forward to PAC to ask what in what yard they can put it, et cetera. There may, may be other restrictions that we'd want to, um, to consider. Thank you for the question. Uh, Councillor Luck, please. Thank you, Your Worship. My question is directed through you to Ms. Jarvis. Um, I'm wondering, I'm just reading the email um, from Mr. Kovitz, dated on March the 15th, so just a week ago. And he had, I guess, brought up a few things that he would like to be addressed. And I'm just wondering if you could speak to um, that email in terms of are we, what are we doing with his concerns? I guess knowing that he's kind of an expert in this area, I'd just like to get your comments and thoughts on, you know, how we're addressing his concerns. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Ms. Jarvis. Thank you, and through you, uh, we have worked very closely with Mr. Uh, Fletcher Colvitz. Uh, he was one of the people that we met with to discuss this bylaw. We did receive the email and discussed it with the development officer, and we will be sending a, a thank you email to Mr. Colvitz. Um, however, his concerns about the nuisance, I believe, is what you're referring to, um, and um, that definition for a nuisance we received from our solicitor, so we're very confident that that is um, it's what we need. Thank you. Thank you very much. At this point, if there are any, you have a follow-up question? Deputy Mayor Scryer. Thank you for your patience, Your Worship. I just have one more question uh, from the MBBA. Oh. 
Um, the question about grandfathering any existing commercial B operations established within the town limits, is that, are we doing that? Is that a recommendation within the bylaw to grandfather? <coughs> and through you, your worship. We will be requiring that all beekeepers apply for a development permit. Um, we will be, what will happen is those that have already been established, we're going to work with them to bring them into compliance with the bylaw. However, they will be legal non-conforming. So if they have X amount of beehives prior to the bylaw, they would be able to maintain that. However, we're going to have to check with the solicitor to see as the bees die and and go away. Like, it, are, would they have to reduce the number of hives? We're, we're not sure at this point, um, but we are working with the town solicitor uh, to iron that little detail out. But we will be requesting a development permit and the development permit to respond to one of the concerns. The development permit um, is a requirement once they have a development permit, uh, depending on the number of hives they have. Um, if, they, if, if it is found that they are a nuisance uh, through this process, then we can revoke the development permit, and that would re result in the removal of the bees, because a development permit would be what permits the bees on the property. Thank you. I'm going to next in queue. Uh, Councillor Miller, please. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. Um, I, I, you just kind of answered partially my question on the development permit, so you can revoke their usage. Um, what about people that do not have a developer's permit, that they're just doing it? Normally, we get multiple nuisance calls. Do Are we looking at having something added or looking, if it's not tonight, but in the future because it was kind of like what was stated tonight that somebody may be just willing to pay the $300 and no problem, right? They pay it twice a year and they're still happy. Um, we need to have some teeth after that. If, thanks. Thank you for the question. I see that our municipal planning officer, Mr. Dwight Colburn has his hand up. So perhaps we'll go to Mr. Colburn. Mr. Colburn, go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, just following up on uh, Councillor Luck's question, and I will uh, also comment on Councillor uh, Miller's question. So with respect to uh, the email, we recognize, and as Ms. Jarvis has indicated, we recognize there are, you know, beekeeping operations currently happening. Um, if they're not currently in line with the provisions of the bylaw, then it would be considered legal non-conforming use. Again, we would work with those uh, beekeepers to make them aware of the requirements and also work with them to address any ongoing nuisance concerns we're, we have. So there's a number of uh, elements in the bylaw that we can work with to, to, to try to address those nuisance concerns. And then we basically work through the process. Um, again, in terms, of, in terms of fines and the nuisance clause, uh, again, like any fine, there would be actually, you know, legal action that you'd go through and and see what the outcome of that would be. So it's, an, if you will, it would be an iterative process at this point in time, recognizing there are, you know, existing beekeeping operations. We are introducing new provisions. It becomes an educational component, and then moving through that process. Um, and in terms of in terms of uh, Councillor Miller's uh, question, we're again. Is making the beekeepers aware that we now have these provisions are required to get a development permit. And again, it's working through this, through the education process and um, basically bringing everybody in line with, with the requirements. Um, the other thing to note too, is that if, if it comes to a point of where you have X number, an excess number of hives on your property, and let's say you've gone through the steps of trying to address the concerns or the nuisance factors, Removing the bees don't mean we're actually destroying the bees. There's an opportunity to take these bees and potentially move them to another 
another property so that you're actually keeping the bees alive um, versus actually destroying the bees. And that's an important point to work out as well. So thank you, Richard. Thank you, Mr. Colburn. Councillor Bigger, please. Thank you, Worship. I just uh, wanted to make one point and ask one quick question. Uh, the point I wanted to make was just to say thank you, you know, for all the hard work at uh, getting this uh, slowly but surely kind of down the field towards the goalpost. <clears throat> um, I have uh, certainly uh, seen a lot of, you know, tenacity and stick to from sort of all perspectives on this, people who feel passionately about um, apiary and beekeeping and people who are concerned about the uh, condition of their properties and, and safety of their own uh, animals uh, and so on. And uh, the say, and certainly we've seen a lot of hard work on the, uh, the part of our staff. Uh, I think you've done, you know, an excellent job with this. And uh, it seems as though there's a lot of almost Solomonic wisdom being brought to bear here to try to find the reasonable sort of middle ground that addresses everyone's concerns as best can be. Certainly, uh, I can speak for myself, uh, but I, uh, I can see in this a lot of evidence of, you know, an effort by the town to encourage uh, responsible beekeeping. And uh, I would not want anyone to mischaracterize the rate uh, of, of development of this issue kind of over, as you say, it's been a couple of years, you know, but that is in no way a reflection of uh, uh, wanting to somehow mitigate uh, healthy beekeeping. As you point out in your uh, presentation, uh, you know, <laughs> upwards of a third of the world's food supply relies on pollinated, uh, pollinating, um, uh, pollen gathering, you know, uh, insects. And so I wanted to just make that point. Certainly that's important. And it, it, I think this is receiving the attention it deserves, you know. Uh, I just wanted to ask from, um, from uh, Mr. Colpitt's email, uh, he um, says here in his first point that the MBBA is asking to be included in discussions of what is considered unreasonable related to the defining of nuisance. And I'm just wondering if you have any re any under like any idea why the NBBA would want to be included in that discussion. The MBBA doesn't really have any, as I understand it, role in uh, other than sort of giving us the information we need to develop a, a bylaw. As you point out, our definition has been uh, vetted by the solicitor so as to protect the town and, you know, give it the kind of teeth it needs. Uh, so I'm just wondering if you have any idea what the point of that is. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I can understand Mr. Colpitz would be interested in, in participating in that. He's been a large part of, of the development of this bylaw. Um, I feel that we've 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 come to the end of the, the line, though, that the time has, is now. <laughs> um, you know, he's looking at it from uh, the beekeeper's point of view and just to ensure that it's maybe not uh, more on the residential side, I I'm not sure. But, but I, I'm pretty confident that the definition um, that we have is sufficient. Um, unreasonable. I did find definitions quite easily um, online that I think uh, would work quite quite well. So, thank you. I'm going to go back to Mr. Colburn, please. Mr. Colburn. Thank you, Worship, and uh, through you to Councillor Bigger. Um, I um, I did read the email from Mr. Colpitz and his, I think his, his point, and I think it's to be well taken, is that it's important to keep the association aware of any issues or uh, happenings that may affect in terms of bees and the bee population. Also, we have to realize that that's an association that uh, there's a number of beekeepers who have expertise that we don't have. So maybe in some situations, there may be some resources or tools that we, they may have or knowledge that they may wish to share that may address a certain item. So it's it's not so much re not reaching to them to enforce our bylaws or uh, that association wishing to enforce our bylaws. It's basically to be you know kept up to, to speed on some issues 
to be a resource or a tool that we could use to potentially address any concerns. So it's, I think it's a collaborative approach and I think it's a very positive one. Uh, again, we have to realize that this is, is a new territory, not only for our municipality, but I think a number of municipalities across the province who are probably looking at this bylaw amendment, looking at uh, the steps that we've taken, what we've learned from it. So I think it needs to be a collaborative approach. And I think that's the intent of Mr. Colt's uh, statement there. And I do welcome uh, that, that knowledge and resource to be a part of this process, recognizing that it's ultimately the municipality who enforces the bylaw. But again, it's going through that uh, educational collaborative process to exhaust all the tools you have uh, before you, know, you all of a sudden look at you know, re relocating the hives or, or going to that extent or getting into fines and, and uh, legal action. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Mr. Colburn. I'm going to go to Councillor Luck, please. Thank you, Your Worship, through you to uh, Ms. Jarvis again. So uh, I'm going back to my original question, um, just because the email did have three different um, points to it. So you, you were able to address um, the first point. And I guess I just, um, so I have a few things. I wanted to build on what Mr. Colburn had said, and I'm wondering if there'd be some value. Just, again, people move on from their positions, you know, um, if there would be value in putting somewhere in the bylaw, because I think when Mr. Colburn explained it, I think there's some value in collaborating with experts like the NBBA, more so for support to make sure, like, you know, this example, you know, that we, I guess, brought us here is that we didn't know that perhaps a, a kiddie pool might solve the problem. So anyway, I'm just wondering if there would be some value in adding a line somewhere in the bylaw so that if, you know, 10 years down the road and everyone's retired, enjoying <laughs> their retirement, new people coming in, you know, because it's great that we're saying, yes, we'll do it. But if it's not written anywhere, will the next kind of group uh, follow suit? So that's one thing. I also wanted to um, ask what the cost of a development permit is, because we are going to be asking all of our residents to now get one. So that's another question. And then just the um, part number two on the email, um, Mr. Kulpit's, um comments around his concern about requiring adjustments for different placements of the beehives on the property for better beehive management. And I wonder what that looks like. Well, if I'm a beehive or a beekeeper and I put my development permit in and because of the size of my land or, you know, what's best for my bees, I can't do what the bylaw says. Now, does it mean that I'm going to have to go through PAC and apply for, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So I'm just wondering if there's some flexibility based on what's best for the bees if there's flexibility in the bylaw or clarity in the bylaw in terms of what that looks like. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Luck. And I just want clarification. So are you asking that we tap into other resources when bylaws are being changed or? Um, I, I think it was more around the point number one where um, I guess having something where if an issue comes up and there's a grievance, um, you know, either a nuisance, a, a complaint or what have you that there's a line saying that, you know, the town will consult the experts in the area for support just so that, you know, we don't kind of charge in again, not now, because I know we all agree that it's the good, the right thing to do. But in 10 years, if it's an old bylaw and we haven't um, revived it and there's new people around the table, would they just charge in and take nuisance face value and say it's nuisance versus even kind of thinking, oh, we should reach out to the NBBA for <laughs> some insights or support on solutions. So I was just thinking there might be an opportunity to write something in there. So again, it reminds anyone looking at the bylaw kind of a process. Thank you. And I, I, I think it's just speaking on behalf of staff, I believe it was council who rushed in, but historically uh, the staff have always tapped into other resources. I've been here for 11 or 12 years now, and, and that has always been the way, and we always also tap into our legal counsel as well. So uh, I don't know if that goes without saying, Mr. Colburn, I don't know if it's necessary to put that in, uh, because my, my experience tells me that uh, we do typically tap into the, uh, the toolbox with, with those who are learned in whatever discussion we have. Mr. Colburn? Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I would concur with, with your observation and your statement. I think at this stage, we could uh, obviously take Councillor Luck's uh, request, and I would 
sort of just run it by our solicitor to see what ramifications or if that actually needs to be stated in the bylaw itself. If there's some other mechanism that we can look at, some sort of policy statement or something along with that lines. But we're we're into the potential first and second readings. We could just sort of have a um, follow up to that and bring it back a subsequent meeting. But I do concur with you. Situations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Coburn. Uh, Councillor Olson, please. Oh, your worship, she didn't. I'm going to go to Mr. Olson first, please. Thank you, Worship. Uh, I guess that uh, I'm concerned with the uh, the creation of the development permit as it relates to grandfathering in, and it says that they they would not be restricted. Beekeepers would not be restricted to the new bylaw numbers unless necessary. And I would suggest that unless necessary means when it's a trouble period, when it's a trouble location. And uh, I think the idea of uh, identifying the number of hives that would be uh, permitted would be identified within the developer's uh, development print, uh, development permit. And so I would uh, think that this is the place where we would make that initial uh, restriction on trouble areas. So. I, I can't see us creating a uh, development permit with identified restrictions and then saying, well, and it's already been there and not recognize that that particular location is a trouble location. So I, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about just grandfathering in everything that, uh, that, uh, uh, that is contrary to the uh, new bylaw numbers, uh, and, but because of its being grandfathered that is just automatically, uh, you know, approved or let to be operating on. So I just think that uh, the the, uh, the identified property right now that we're uh, dealing with is far in excess of what we're proposing as a normal operation within the town of Chris Pam Sis. And I, I can't see uh, grandfathering in a trouble spot. Thank you. Thank you. Did you want to respond to that, uh, either Ms. Darvis or Mr. Colburn? And then I'll go back to Councillor Luck, and I apologize, Councillor Luck. Um, okay. Just take a moment to collect myself here. <laughs> so it's not that we're grandfathering in something, it's that the law doesn't exist now. So anything that's happened previous to that is legal non-conforming. So once the bylaw comes into act to law, anything that's existing is already legal non-conforming at that moment. So we are gonna work with a development permit to say, everybody's gonna need a development permit so we can go in and review where things are. If they have more than the allotted number of hives that are in the provisions, um, I can check with our solicitor, but I'm really not sure there's much that we would be able to enforce on that side. We would not be able to allow them to increase the number, and as I explained earlier, as the hives died off, we wouldn't allow them to be reestablished. I know it seems a far stretch, but, that's um, that's how it's gonna, the process will play out. And then we will work to bring um, neighbors or uh, residents that still are, that may continue to be a nuisance. That's why that nuisance clause is in the bylaw to protect our residents. And we're confident that that gives us at least a standing point where we have nothing before. I Thank can you. answer Councillor Luck's question uh, as yes, well. <laughs> yes. Uh, Councillor Luck, did you want to add anything to no, those? No, I'm fine. It's just the, the two questions about the cost of the permit and then just what that process would look like if someone does have to rearrange their hives. Thank you. And, and again, I apologize, Councillor Luck. So through you, your worship, uh, development permit cost would be $50. Uh, that's, that's a standard uh, lowest fee. Um, in terms of uh, needing to establish the hives in a different location, um, we're looking at a lot that's 1,140 square meters. 
um, three meters in from the sidelines in the backyard. It's a large area. Um, I, th I think we could make it work if for whatever reason they can't have the entrances facing inwards and they have to be facing outwards, they would have to request a variance and um, I would have to check and see if that type of variance could be approved through the development officer or if it would have to go through PAC. The difference there is a, would be a um, $150 charge for development officer and $300 if it's PAC. Oh, absolutely, yes. And I'm just going to go to Mr. Colburn. He has something to add. Go ahead, Mr. Colburn. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, to Hunter Lux. So it would be development permit. It would be similar to uh, a variance process. Um, we would provide the avenue that it could go through the development officer. The Community Planning Act does allow the development officer to grant variances with respect to the, the placement of a structure. And that's how this would be looked at. Uh, so in terms of orientation of openings and those types of things, then that would an opportunity would be to go through the development officer. Um, if it development officer does have the authority in the, if it is uh, somewhat of a contentious issue to, to direct it to the planning advisory committee or the applicant uh, can, um, can request to go through the planning advisory committee. Those, those uh, mechanisms are in place through the community planning act. And they are now in our zoning bylaw in terms of development officer variances. Thank you. Councillor Bigger. Thank you, Your Worship. If there are no further questions, I'd be glad to read the findings of the PAC if you'd like. Were there any summation remarks or are you finished? Okay. Thank you very much, Ms. Jarvis. Uh, go ahead, uh, Councillor Bigger. So, this is a notice of decision on zoning bylaw amendment. Take notice that a decision of the Quispam CIS Planning Advisory Committee was rendered in the matter of your request pursuant to the provisions of the Community Planning Act of New Brunswick. One, matter requested a request for the Planning Advisory Committee to review the proposed zoning bylaw amendment concerning APRA operations and submit their written views to Council pursuant to Section 110 of the Community Planning Act. Two, date, place, and, date and place of consideration, sorry, excuse me, Date, place of consideration of request, date February 14th, 2023, Planning Advisory Committee meeting, Council Chambers. Three, the decision of committee that the Planning Advisory Committee support Council on the zoning bylaw 038-37, beekeeping and apiary operations amendment, dated the 17th day of February, uh, 2023. Violet Brown, Secretary, Planning Advisory Committee. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bigger. Council members, if you have any further questions, now is the time to ask. And if you don't, then a motion may be presented and voted upon. Councillor Bigger, please. Thank you, Your Worship. I would uh, move for uh, first reading of uh, be given to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment number 038-37, a bylaw of the municipality of Quispam Sis respecting APRA operations. It's been moved by Councillor Bigger, seconded by Council, uh, Deputy Mayor Scryer on the question. Councillor Donovan. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I just want to thank everybody who came out to speak um, regarding this proposed apiary uh, bylaw. Um, I do certainly appreciate the concerns and the comments uh, we heard tonight. Looking back quite a, quite a while ago um, to when we first started looking at this in, in 2021, um, I expressed some concerns of my own, um, and you know, while I'll, while, while I will say that staff um, took a lot of those concerns uh, into account when crafting this new uh, bylaw, I still do um, stand firm in my original feelings uh, regarding this this uh, topic. Thank you. Thank you. On the question, it's been moved by Councillor Bigger, seconded by Deputy Mayor Scryer. Please vote now. Motion carried six to one, with the nay vote being Councillor Donovan. Motion two. 
Councillor Bigger, please. Let's do it again. Is that yours yet? <laughs> Uh, I would uh, move that second reading be given to propose zoning bylaw amendment number 038-37, a bylaw of the municipality of Quispam Sis respecting apiary operations. Thank you. Thank you. It's been moved by Councillor Bigger, seconded by Councillor Miller on the question. Seeing there are none, please vote now. Motion carried 6-1. All in favor with a negative vote coming from Councillor Donovan. Thank you. So that ends uh, this evening's public presentation. For those of you who would like to leave, thank you for being here this evening and showing your interest in the town of Quispam Sis. Item number seven, minutes of the previous council meeting, February 21st, 2023. Deputy Mayor Scryer. So moved. It's been moved that the meetings, uh, the minutes of the previous meeting be accepted. Seconded by Councillor Thompson on the question. Please vote now. Motion carried 7-0. Next item, correspondence. 9A, oh sorry, unfinished business. Did we have any, no. Thank you. Item number 9A, Councillor Kerry Luck, request for addition of legislated public notices on the town of Quispam Sis Facebook site. Councillor Luck. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, before I put a motion, I, I would like to just make some comments. Um, so I brought this motion to Council to support our newly developed mission of providing community-focused service excellence and forward-thinking commitment to responsible governance and engaged residents. Um, so as I pointed out in my submission, the Local Governance Act and the Community Planning Act provides guidance on ways in which notice should be given to inform our Quispemsis town residents of up upcoming council decisions on such things as bylaws and zoning, like we saw tonight. Um, we can use newspaper, radio, TV, or our town website, and if one of these three are used, then we may also post on social media. So the intent behind giving notice is to ensure our town residents are given timely notice of town business and to provide them with an opportunity to be informed on discussions coming before council and to share their opinions in a formal manner. The thought that residents will proactively go to our website just in case there might be something posted uh, that they might want to see is not perhaps the best way to reach or notify our residents. Um, when you look at the other two approaches, which would be TV, radio, or newspaper, there's a bit of a push there where someone is going through those and can still happen upon the notice. So our approach should ensure our residents are informed. Um, it should be proactive. Um, it, currently, we have 5.8 thousand likes and 6.6 .6 thousand followers on our Facebook page. Facebook is still the most used social platform in Canada. 80% of Canadians have a Facebook account and 70% of those use it on a daily basis. Scary but true. Um, so I would propose putting notices about upcoming council business on our town Facebook site would actually improve transparency, citizen engagement, and communication. Uh, residents are more likely to see a public notice while scrolling through their Facebook page as, it may, as, um, as many do on a regular basis as compared to going to our town website to look for a notice they may not know exists. It was suggested that we should uh, wait until provincial government mandates us to do this. Uh, we have all used Facebook as a campaign platform and our town has three Facebook account accounts. So I think we can probably all appreciate the reach Facebook can have. I don't think we should wait to be mandated by the province to enhance our communication and resident awareness and engagement. I appreciate following the rules of legislation, but I think in this case, we need to not only follow the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law, which is to ensure our residents are given notice. One could argue that residents, um, the resistance to posting notices on Facebook um, by the town may be perceived by residents as us not wanting to, to have too many objections or contrary opinions given to proposed changes. It's a lot less work to get things passed when residents do not know about them. So again, I, I worry that that might be the perception. 
Thank um, you. Uh, we don't have a motion on the table. I'd prefer there be a, a motion. motion. Okay. So, um, all right. And then I'll just finish. Ready. As long as it's new information from the February meeting, yep. because yep. we've gone through this, we spent about half an hour on it uh, already, and I, I'd like to move forward with it with the motion first, please. Okay. So I would like to move that the Town of Quiz Femsis start to post any required town notices on our town Facebook page um, to complement what we currently do, which is putting them on our website. It's been moved by Councillor Lux, seconded by Councillor Donovan. On the question now, Councillor Lux. Okay, thank you. Um, so anyway, just a few more comments. Um, so in terms of just um, speaking about uh, the posts on Facebook wouldn't have to be long. Uh, what I would suggest is that we do the same as we currently do on our website, which is just have the main title posted with a link to read more and then have the link redirect them to our website with all the details. And this way it's still seen on Facebook and residents are more likely to know what the bylaw and zoning um, is to be discussed at council. Um, and also, I guess another concern was if people share their opinions on Facebook, I personally think this is would be no different than the numerous emails and phone calls we get from residents about controversial topics. We as council still come with an open mind and listen to the public hearings uh, with an unbiased lens before making a decision. So if people want to rant about a topic on social media, they will find a way with or without us posting a notice about it. And I also don't think this approach will alienate people and we I don't think we'll lose followers. I, I think it might be just the opposite. If we start posting information that impact our residents through changes in bylaws and zoning, perhaps we would gain even more followers. Currently, our website um, has five posted notices and three of them are actually about the fire pit, our strap plan and road construction. So there's really only four notices. Uh, we could even post. Point of order has been called. Okay. Yes. So I guess I'm just making the point in terms of why I put the motion forward. So um, I, I think that uh, we could post more than one notice on the same post uh, if they were being posted on the same day, again, with a link. So it wouldn't be onerous or it wouldn't take up a lot of space on the pages. And just lastly, I think ensuring our residents have easier enhanced access to information and notices about business coming before council is part of our mission, specifically, as I mentioned, community-focused service excellence, forward thinking, and responsible governance and engage re engaged residents. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lock. Councillor Miller, please. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I have to agree with Councillor Lock. I, I don't think we need to put much on the website, but I think it's something very simple as um, this week, topics at Town of Quist are 1, 2, 3, 4. For more information, click www.quizpamsis.ca meetings because you, you don't we don't want to post everything on there just because it just becomes another clutter thing plus we have sometimes our council kits are 100 pages right so um, I, I, I think it's not a bad idea just to very simply this is what's going on this week if you want to know click um, you may or may not get people to click but um, I, I wouldn't write like one of the examples here I wouldn't be putting everything out there but if somebody wants to go and check it out they can check it out uh, a discussion at a different time would be, is Monday the right day? We had this discussion a few years back. Do we do it on a Friday? But um, I, I think there's nothing wrong with posting very simplistic, here's what's happening this week. If you want to find out, they do, they do. If they don't, they don't. So we're going to get good and bad comments on, on the website regardless. So it's uh, I've seen those. Thanks. I'll, I'll make a comment. I'll just remove myself from the chair. I, I would disagree. I, I do believe that when one posts on Facebook, social media, it does become open. You, you do become a target, uh, been there. Uh, I know how cruel people can be. They can uh, extrapolate a, a picture or an item and post that on their own page, and then you certainly are set up to be a target. I agree that it would be great to have, um, uh, to post because, it, you know, uh, we do need to have other venues to uh, to ensure that people are informed, but I don't know that Facebook would be the one that I would choose. I just feel that we are setting ourselves up for uh, uh, as a target. I'll go to um, 
Acting CEO, Mr. Kennedy, please. Thank you, Your Worship, and I appreciate the motion uh, that uh, Councillor Luck has put forward, but I think in the interest of, of clarity, what Councillor Miller just suggested is not what Councillor Luck's motion uh, entails, where we just talk about, you know, simply putting things on there sort of willy-nilly. That's, that's where we run into trouble. Um, this organization, this municipality has a pretty uh, strong record when it comes to ensuring that we follow you know, provincial legislation, uh, because there are times that you can end up uh, in Peel Plaza defending um, things in front of a, a Court of King's Bench Justice. Um, so if we're, my feeling is if council were to pass the motion as presented tonight, um, as was included in the staff report, we would then be required to post that as is on Facebook, which is what one has to do if they're publishing that in the newspaper, um, or if they're publishing that on the website. So you wouldn't be able to take a shortcut in that um, regard because then again, you could have someone come forward and say, well, the act says you need to follow one of these three items, which is newspaper, radio, or television, or the website. But the town of Quispam says you've also said Facebook and you didn't follow through with the Facebook post. Um, and I guess if council is really concerned about information being disseminated to the residents, um, you could argue that maybe you don't stop at Facebook. We have between the Quispam Sis and the Qplex Twitter pages, close to 8,000 followers there. Um, there's Instagram. Um, you know, if you were, if it, again, if council is really concerned that the people of Quispam Sis don't know what's going on, um, and we would never espouse this, but we could post those public notices in our facilities at the Qplex, at the QMA. We could probably ask the library if we could do that. We have a television screen out here that provides information to the public when they're in uh, council chambers uh, in the lobby area. So there's, you know, and if you really wanted to take it to the furthest extreme, we could you know, mail something out to residents, um, everybody in Quispam Sis for public hearings. But I think tonight is a good example. Um, the public presentation that we heard earlier tonight, how many people are really interested in that particular um, rezoning that has been requested um, that probably affects two houses, maybe four, maybe six. Um, again, you put that out on Facebook, you're just serving it up for the, the keyboard warriors, the, the community killers, um, you know, we, we, we see that out there as well. And so I don't know why we would do that. Um, you know, negative comments toward a business owner in our community, just, just setting ourselves up for all sorts of, of pratfalls that were identified, um, in the staff report. So that's, that's staff's concern. If, if obviously if the wish of council is to do that, then we're, we're certainly going to move forward with that. But again, I just wonder if we're, if we're really that concerned, you know, why stop just at Facebook and go on to these other um, areas as well. But there certainly are some concerns and, you know, um, there is a reason why the provincial government still requires us to post things uh, in a newspaper. Uh, the Municipal Capital Borrowing Board that's in reports tonight from the uh, Regional Service Commission, they have to do that as well. And the actual provincial government wants the clipped newspaper version, not an internet uh, printed version. They want you to buy the newspaper, put the scissors to it, cut it out and mail it to them, which is pretty antiquated in this day and age. But part of the reason for that is that that's the original it can't be altered. Someone couldn't come back and say, well, you changed your Facebook post. You had a mistake in it. You did this, you did that. Uh, the newspaper, <laughs> believe it or not, literally lives forever. So, um, you know, certainly we're, uh, we're happy to follow whatever guidance council gives us tonight, but uh, those are the, uh, the pratfalls and uh, the negative side effects of this decision that uh, staff is concerned about, Your Worship. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Uh, we'll go to Councillor Donovan, please. Thank you. Um, I do agree with Councillor Luck. However, I, I can also see, you know, uh, both ends of the aisle. I'm not too dense. I can see, you know, how it could be bad and how it could be good. You know, I, in my personal opinion, I think it, you know, could provide an additional layer of transparency. You know, like Chris Pam Sis has always been ahead of the curve when it comes to, you know, trying to connect with our residents and and um, be, like putting ourselves out there. I guess. Um, and I, I guess I would also, you know, be in favor of, of any form of for, uh, social media. I don't think it just has to be Facebook. I think Facebook throughout the conversation is, has come up, um, but I don't think the intent, and again, I can't speak for anybody, I don't think the, the intent was to specifically just be Facebook. 
Um, and something else I, I thought I'd brought up, bring up too is, you know, that I, I have been looking into it and I have seen, you know, our neighbors, the town of Rasse post, I have seen them post their, their notices once in a while. And I, I mean, the town of Rasse is still standing. So I don't, I mean, I, I, I understand the concern and I understand looking ahead, but I think sometimes we might be a little too cautious for our own good. But I, again, that's my own, my own opinion. Um, but thanks. Thank you. Councillor Luck. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, and thank you to the councillors that uh, shared their opinions. Um, so I, I did want to actually just build off of what uh, Councillor Donovan had said. So uh, from what I can tell, both Farase and Grand Bay both currently post their notices. Um, to address the issue, like if we are as a town very concerned about negative comments, again, we can always turn off the comments and then truly have it as just here's a notice. And then, you know, again, if people want to comment, they're going to have to cut and paste and create a new post to complain about it. Similar to what that they similar to what they could do, you know, through the website if they, they were that passionate about it. Um, in terms of being concerned about a shortcut, currently on our website, all we have is the heading and basically a line and you have to click a link to read more. So I'm not sure why Facebook would be any different where we could just put notice and have the line, like on our website, we don't actually have the whole thing printed out. You actually have to click another click to actually read more. So again, I would see us doing the same thing on a Facebook post where there's a hyperlink in the Facebook post that would bring us to the website and that would solve that problem. And then in terms of, you know, newspapers, I totally agree it is antiquated and we realize that that's what the government wants. But those examples aren't really what we're talking about here. We're just talking about notices for bylaws and for um, zoning where with, you know, so in terms of the, um, the two acts that I mentioned. So, you know, um, but, but again, I guess it goes to show that, um, um, you know, the concern around, you know, things being modified, we can say that now because our notices are only being posted on our website. So I don't want it to be, you know, people being worried that someone's going to come back and say we changed it because technically right now our notices could be changed because they're electronic and not in the paper. So I just wanted to um, clarify some of those things. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Miller, please. Oh, thank you, Your Worship. <clears throat> um, and I do hear everybody's concerns and I guess I don't I don't care if it's Facebook Twitter snapchat um, all it was is just a venue to get somebody to a link towards our website so you don't even have to put much on it said coming this week um, so I, I don't understand when there was talks about King's Court and and stuff like that I, I don't get it maybe I just don't get it but um, I'm not asking to stop doing anything in the newspaper. I'm not telling you to stop doing anything else we do, but it, it, it's just, I don't see the problem of just saying, here's the link to our agenda. Because as an example, I went to today's agenda, it's 295 pages. We're not putting 295 pages on Facebook. <clears throat> you just want a link to, here you go. And it, it, and I was just saying, if, if you want to put something on, in the front of it, you could, but just say, it could be just as simple as this week's meeting at Quiz Pam Sis. We want to know what's going on, click here. Don't have any any um, any words underneath it and don't have any comments. So I, I, I guess I just don't understand that maybe if the ICO could explain the legal ramifications, I, 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 I don't get it, but thanks. Thank you, Councilor Miller. I will ask the acting CAO to respond. Thank you very much, Your Worship, through you to Councillor Miller, and I might call upon the clerk to perhaps uh, back me up on this, but you know, the public hearing process is a very formalized uh, legal uh, endeavor, um, you know, down to the fact that uh, the mayor's chair calls three times if there's anyone else uh, wanting to speak for or against an item. Those are the, the parameters, the rules. We can't ask once, we can't ask twice, we have to ask three times. So the Act states that we have to put that to the public, provide notice in one of three ways, newspaper, radio or television, or on our website. The next section that says, if you meet one of these three criteria, then you can put it on social media, to me is superfluous, then you can do whatever you want, which goes back to posting this within our facilities or um, you know, 
putting it on uh, out on, by a Canada Post via letter mail, um, whatever it is that you want to do once you make one of those three items. But if the town were to um, add to this and say, we are going to post it here, we're going to post it there, then we would be obligated, in my opinion, to follow the legal mandates within the Act as well, which would be, um, as the motion is read, if I recall correctly, I don't have it right in front of me, um, to complement what we currently do and publish, publish those public notices. So we would then be potentially opening ourselves up to potential legal jeopardy because we didn't do it properly on Facebook or Facebook was down on the day that was 30 days before. The, there's just all sorts of, of pratfalls. And I, again, I'm just not sure where the benefit is. Um, as anyone who has a Facebook account knows, um, you often lose touch with many of your friends. You never see any of their updates. Well, if you don't engage, the algorithm shuts it off. So if a couple of Chris Pam Sis posts go by that are you know, legal bureaucratic ease that is not of interest to you and you don't engage with it, all of a sudden you stop seeing the Chris Pam Sis posts, which is not what we want. Um, and you know, it's been in place for the better part of 10 years, it's it served us well. Um, I think one could argue that the reason why it is so popular is because people go there looking for recreational information and community events, and they're just not interested in the day-to-day -day, um, goings-on. We know that there are people who are, and they avail themselves of that information on the website. So we would like to see the website, which is going to be new and improved this summer, remain as sort of the legal bureaucratic side of the op operation with the ability to go in and find out other information. And Facebook, which is more timely, family-friendly, fun things that are going on for the most part. Um, and obviously pertinent things, you know, in the emergency situation and the flood or that, but just the sort of the the day-to-day -day operations of a municipality, I don't think that you would find that most larger municipalities, and we can't lose sight of the fact that we are the sixth largest municipality in New Brunswick, are availing themselves of that method. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Councillor Bigger, please. Thank you very much, Your Worship. Um, this discussion is spinning out like a good old Facebook thread, as it turns out. Uh, I, I have a, a, a question, like, uh, and this is not, I hope this doesn't sound sassy, but I mean, do we have any evidence of, of the residents of the town feeling that they're not being updated enough about things that are coming up on the council agendas? I mean, uh, I'm not, like, I don't think that, um, I appreciate the passion for transparency 100%, and I think that nobody presupposes that we're working, uh, you know, to... Uh, hide things or keep things from people or or mitigate our responsibilities uh, of transparency to people. I, I, I took a look at our, I mean, I take a look at our Facebook page and I, I see for the town, the, uh, and I see that there was uh, an invitation for people to tune in on YouTube this evening and a link to, of course, the agenda that's housed on our, our corporate website. And I just did a little quick review of a couple of other uh, communities in our province and I see that that's it looks to me like that's a pretty, pretty much sort of commensurate with what's happening uh, elsewhere. Uh, I saw that there's one community that's uh, conducting a survey related to the possible change of a bylaw to allow uh, large sort of oversized four-wheel drives onto certain uh, town streets uh, for certain reasons, um, you know, events and so on. So they were uh, asking for people's feedback in the town in that town about that. And so in that regard, I guess they're kind of looking for some information from folks that could have an effect on a bylaw. But I, I, I feel like what we do is uh, I, take, I take seriously Councillor Luck's uh, assertion about the, um, the need for us to always be committed to transparency and, and, and good communication and good information. But I also pay heed a lot to what the acting CAO is, is uh, referencing related to kind of the need to um, decide, to, to bear in mind what, if any, sort of liability could exist by being foolhardy or frivolous or spurious about this sort of thing. And where does it stop? I mean, as a musician, I'm sort of challenged at times. I was complaining about it before the meeting started tonight as a commercial sort of artist. You know, I'm challenged sometimes with the sense of like I have to be some kind of an expert at every social media platform that exists, and I can't. I, I cross post endlessly with what I do related to kind of my touring and my music and so on, 
and uh, you know it's wearying, and uh, often it can feel as though if I miss one uh, social media platform on a particular update, I might sort of miss reaching everybody that I'm wanting to reach, and so. I, I'm not eager to kind of make that a responsibility for the staff of our town either. And so I guess I return back to what I said initially. It doesn't seem to me that there is uh, a sense in our town that people are not getting the information that they, that they need. And I feel as though for those who are interested to find out more about what's going on, we do seem to be providing opportunity for people to find that information. I'm very eager to see... The, oh, I'm excited about the overhaul of our corporate website, and I expect that that'll reflect uh, some of this conversation as well. But So I just wanted to make those points. I, I don't think that anyone should presuppose we're trying to not communicate effectively with people. But I do take uh, kind of the acting CAO's words very seriously, uh, especially as he relates it to kind of the provincial uh, legislation around how we inform uh, related to things like public meetings and so on. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bigger. And, and to answer your question from my vantage point, I have not had anyone call me to say that they didn't know what was going on in the town of Quispam Sis. And I get many, many calls every day, every week. So um, I don't know if that settles the question or not, but from my vantage point, I, I've not heard that complaint. Councillor Donovan. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'm just wondering if the um, clerk can walk me through uh, how I might request an amendment. I'm not quite sure what the process on that is. Are you asking for an amendment to the... Current motion. To the current motion. Well, the mover was Councillor Luck, so the mover would have to agree to the amendment. So are you going to make an amendment? Okay, just one second, please. It's nothing drastic, but um, I would like to make an amendment to the current motion where it says Facebook uh, to change that to social media, if that's okay with Councillor Luck. Councillor Luck, are you in agreement to Councillor Donovan's request? Um, I'm, Oops, sorry. I'm wondering if, I mean, I, I'm fine with that. I'm wondering if we should put town, because I know we can, like, with the way social media works, I know at least with Instagram, we have an Instagram, I think we have Twitter. Again, I'm not sure which ones are active. So again, I don't want to create additional, so I don't know if we want to specifically say what social media platforms I know you can cross post where you're just it's it's pretty easy once the post is created you can cross post them I don't know how active we are on Twitter but maybe if the CAO can speak to that and I'm not sure how active we are on Instagram I also have uh, Mr. Rizal waiting to speak go ahead uh, Mr. Kennedy thank you your worship to go back to my earlier comments about the legal pratfalls, I think that amendment makes it worse. Um, you know, TikTok is a social media that uh, the government is banned from uh, government uh, devices, and we've done that as well. Um, so now we're going to go from potentially just putting it on Facebook to now to uh, Twitter that we have, Instagram that we have. If something else comes forward, I think that's just making it... Uh, a little more difficult to defend ourselves if someone were to ever say, well, you didn't post that on Instagram and you said that you were. And again, uh, I, I can't reiterate it enough. There's a, a legislated process that comes to public notice for these particular items. Um, as Councillor Bigger said, we've got the agenda, you know, a link to the agenda on Facebook tonight. If anyone is interested, they can go on that. And um, there was a time um, prior to the uh, audiovisual uh, system being set up here in the council chamber, when we were working uh, and meeting virtually, uh, that we were putting it right directly onto Facebook. Um, it wasn't as if thousands of people that uh, were seeing this scroll by on their uh, feed were stopping to watch the council meeting. So, uh, again, I'm I'm really concerned about the you know, the original motion, but uh, definitely have some major uh, qualms with uh, the potential amendment, Your Worship. Thank you. I'm going to go to um, Mr. Colburn, please. Mr. Colburn, go ahead, please. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, just like to make a couple of comments from 
I guess the planning perspective and, and just my experience over the past um, 19 years when it comes to uh, rezonings, bylaw amendments, municipal plan amendments. So when we get into some of the bigger land use planning documents, for example, a municipal plan introducing a whole new zoning bylaw, there are other items or other things that we do in addition to the Community Planning Act, and they're required through the process. So we get into things like stakeholder engagement. So when you're doing an initial plan, you're reaching out to the developers, you're reaching out to the business community, you're reaching out to the educational community, you're reaching out to the youth. That is part of that process. And when we when we do things with a background study, which is similar to a council would be aware of some of the plans that we've currently done, transportation master plans, recreational master plans, we reach out to stakeholders. That interaction becomes a word on the street. And it, it's very effective in, in communicating what's going on. When, and that's applicable to municipal plan bylaws, any new bylaw we bring in, we usually go through that process. For example, when we did the development permit introduction, because it was a new, um, a new requirement in terms of permitting, we actually reached out directly to a lot of the developers and builders. That direct response generated in a open house at the town hall. Uh, as well as the opportunity for people to provide feedback. We had, I think it was four people who actually showed up at the town hall for uh, an open house. So when we get into some of the actual rezonings that we see of specific properties, that it necessarily impacts just a certain you know, range of people. And as we've, we've seen, once the word gets to a resident within that area, they usually put boots on the ground, they canvass the neighborhoods, they, they generate either support or they generate the concerns, which makes it way to council. We usually have one spokesperson. So it, it comes down to the zone rezonings and those things that are happening. Um, they, they impact a limited number of people. And those, what I've seen over my experience is the tools that we have in place have been effective in communicating what's happening and giving people the opportunity to voice their concerns. So I think it, you have to look at what the tools we have, the experiences that we've seen, and um, and and build on that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Coper. Mr. Rizal, please. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, just building on your comment from earlier, and also the open-ended question from uh, Councillor Baker about whether we re we've received feedback on uh, whether there have been residents that have been uninformed about uh, a particular uh, public hearing or what have you that has come before council. In the, uh, in the uh, roughly seven months that I've been here, I've not received a call or an email of any kind, any, any contact of any kind uh, from any resident suggesting that they were not informed of a pending public hearing or uh, uh, what have you, and and, uh, and and any sort of feedback that would suggest that that a resident uh, has felt left out uh, as a result of something that we did or did not do in terms of a communication strategy. One of the things that I have done since I have been here, uh, and I believe it had been done before, uh, what is that uh, I have worked to include uh, links to the agenda and to uh, this live feed, in fact, uh, of all of our council meetings uh, each and every uh, Tuesday that they are held. Uh, I put a post up earlier today promoting this meeting here tonight and uh, with a link to the agenda for, for those who want to see it as well. Uh, there have been a couple of references tonight as well to the refreshed website and that is in the hopper as many of you have talked about and one of the things that uh, that can and likely will be featured as part of this new site is the ability for a resident to uh, go into the site and actually request to receive automatic notifications if there is a public hearing that is going to be coming up. And that is, that's a feature that we're going to have on this new site, the ability for someone to sign up and say, yes, I want to be notified when there is a public hearing. That gives them that automatic option. It'll come right into their email saying a new public hearing is coming. Uh, you know, and here's a link to more information that it's just another tool for people to be able to, uh, you know, to, to, to be able to get that information. Uh, and, and just one last thought before I wrap up here, just to sort of a question that uh, maybe Councillor Dunneman can answer or someone else 
uh, kind of picking up on, on what our CAO has said, uh, if we, uh, uh, if the proposed amendment is approved, does that mean that uh, these public hearing notifications would have to go on all of our social media platforms and not just Facebook? Would it mean Instagram? Would it mean Twitter? Uh, would, we, would we be blanketing our community with this information potentially unnecessarily? Uh, when it's already, when we're already meeting the legislated requirements that are coming down from the provincial government. So that, that's, uh, those are my comments and I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rizal. Councillor Luck. Uh, thank you, Worship. Um, I just wanted to make a few comments on some of the things that were said. So, um, and maybe it's my age, but I, you know, residents my age, I do hear from them that they don't feel informed and maybe it's because they use Facebook more so than the website. So I have been hearing it. If I hadn't been hearing it, then I wouldn't have brought it up as an issue. But, um, you know, and again, I know one of our goals in our strategic plan is to enhance community engagement. So um, that's actually the rationale of why I brought it up. Um, and in terms of our concern about, you know, the legalities, I think in the legislation, and I mean, and maybe we should be reaching out to our neighboring communities that are giving formal notifications on Facebook, if it's that really big of a deal. Um, and uh, Councillor Luck, uh, I think we've gone through all of the points, and uh, I, pardon me? I said there's a motion on the floor. There's a motion on the floor. You've, uh, you've expressed your concerns and your opinions, and uh, we've heard from everyone. I have still Councillor Donovan, uh, who I believe wants to speak to his amendment, but I don't think that there is going to be anything further by rehashing what we've already discussed. So, uh, uh, Councillor Donovan. Thank you. Um, I didn't think it was that big of a deal as, as far as my amendment. You know, I, I common sense would tell me that you can't <coughs> post on what you don't have. So TikTok, Snapchat, everybody brought those up. In the, the proposed motion, it says town notices on towns and if I, it had have gone through, it would have been town's social media. So if the town doesn't have TikTok or it doesn't have Snapchat, then obviously you can't post on it. Um, but just for the sake of clarity and um, to you know send this to a vote, I would retract uh, my amendment and move forward from there. Thanks. Thank you. The motion's been moved by Councillor Locke, seconded by Councillor Donovan on the question motion that the town of Quispan Sus start to publish town notices on the town's Facebook pages to complement what we're currently doing on town website with a link. Please vote now. Motion defeated. Those in favor, Councillor Donovan, Councillor Luck. Those against, Deputy Mayor Scryer, Councillor Bigger, Councillor Thompson, Councillor Miller, Councillor Olson. On to the next item. Nominating committee's recommendations to change name of COMEX Transit Committee and expand the mandate. So the request was for the Comics Committee name to be changed to uh, the Transit Committee, Transportation Committee, and that its mandate be ex included to uh, or expanded to include the Comex Regional Public Transit, Taxis, Ride Sharing, and other transportation related items as the committee deems appropriate. Councillor Olson. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, be it resolved that the Comex tra Transit Committee <coughs> be renamed Transportation Committee and that its mandate be expanded to include Comex, regional public transit, taxis, ride sharing, and other transportation related items as the committee deems appropriate. Thank you. It's been moved by Councillor Olson, seconded by Deputy Mayor Scryer. On the question, Councillor Donovan. 
Councillor Bigger. Thank you, Your Worship. Just a quick bit of context on this uh, for the benefit of Council. Uh, at our last uh, con uh, Transit Committee meeting recently, we were uh, chatting about, uh, as usual, uh, the COMEX and uh, continued challenges and opportunities that it presents to the community. But as well, we were uh, considering the new uh, relationship that we will have with the Regional uh, Service Commission and their mandate to establish a transit a transportation uh, committee. And we sort of concluded that there was value uh, probably in uh, shuffling a little bit uh, of the, these different sort of portfolios to come in under one heading to be more congruent with the uh, mandate of the Regional Service uh, Commission. And as well, uh, there was some sense that uh, efforts that we would want to make, um, whether <laughs> some of which are in certainly in just sort of a brainstorming, uh, you know, at a brainstorming level currently, but in trying to um, imagine and uh, plan for uh, ongoing and, and developing and evolving transportation needs of residents in our community, the overall evolution of our community, the size of the community, the fact that there are uh, lots of folks, uh, we see high density housing in increasing in our community. We see that there are more people uh, who are able to, Quispamsis becomes more and more becomes a, uh, uh, perhaps self-sustaining is overstating it, but a community where lots of people uh, have no reason to leave through the day, but they may be faced with, uh, that is to say leave the community, but may rather, may still be faced with challenges at getting around town that would be, and so perhaps it would be of great benefit if there was some service that could be developed uh, akin to, you know, we look to St. John and the work they're doing with their uh, on-demand uh, service currently, uh, that sort of thing. And so that was sort of what spawned this discussion, and it just seemed that uh, with what's happening uh, around the province related to ride sharing and with taxis, we just thought everything should would probably fit neatly under sort of one title and uh, that merited the change to transportation committee. And again, in reference to, in deference, I should say, to what the uh, FRSC is mandated as well. So thank you. Thank you. It's been moved by Councillor Olson, seconded by Deputy Mayor Scryer on the question. Councillor Olson. Thank you, Worship. Uh, everything that Councillor Bigger has said is what I was trying to accomplish with the issue of my motion. Um, I think that uh, we have two good representatives for the town prepared to work on all of these issues. And it's the first one that's been presented to us after the presentation earlier tonight that we're gonna be involved with the whole region and we're gonna possibly have cost sharing and all kinds of different things associated with tra uh, transportation. So we're looking for some real true leadership from Councillor Miller and Councillor Bigger. So thank, them, thank you for your support there. Thank you for those words. On the question, please vote now. Motion carries 7-0. Item 9C, proposed budget schedule. There is a motion in front of you. Councillor Miller. Um, well, I'll do the motion. I see Chris to, so on, on the line there. Um, that the proposed 2024 budget schedule be approved and prepared as prepared slash amended. Yeah. It's been moved by Councillor Miller, seconded by Deputy Mayor Scryer on the question. Seeing there are none. Councillor Miller. Okay. Please vote now. Motion carried 7-0. Item 9D, upgrade on Gondola Point Road wastewater pump stations and Gondola Point Road corridor study. Uh, that's by Deputy Mayor Scryer. There's a motion that can be read, please, before we begin the discussion. Deputy Mayor Scryer. I would move one recommendation is the, to initiate council's strategic discussion regarding the Gondola Point Road and these be held after the Gondola Point Road AT corridor public presentation. 
Thank you. It's been moved by Deputy Mayor Scryer, seconded by Councillor Thompson on the question. Councillor Thompson, no. Councillor Olson. No, that's fine, Your Worship. On the question, please vote now. Councilman. Motion carried 7 0, item 9 E, update on Hampton Road wastewater or water system rather, expansion. Uh, and that was something I had put in, and there is a motion. Deputy Mayor Scryer. Yes, I would move that one recommendation is to initiate council's strategic discussion regarding the Hampton Road water system and priorities for development of the distribution system. Thank you. It's been moved by Deputy Mayor Scryer, seconded by Councillor Miller on the question. Councillor Olson. No, thank you. No, thank you. Okay. Councillor Miller. Um, I, I just want to, on the question you said to strategic discussions, I know we've read the, or sorry, read the, uh, the report from Director of Engineering. I think water is one of these things that we have to prioritize. He, he's with us now. On, oh, sorry. On, he's virtually. Uh, oh, okay. Thank you. No, go ahead, Councillor Miller. I, I was just informing you that he is there. Oh, sorry. No, I was I was saying that uh, I think it's something that we have to look into. We've been doing it piecemeal, and if we continue it at our current piecemeal, it's going to take uh, a long time. So obviously getting down Hampton Road is one if you're looking for different types of uh, uh, expansion, but also when you're looking at water usage around here, uh, apartments, major complexes, duplexes, Eventually, we've got to get to water. Um, and, and for those that weren't here, when we did a study in 2019, Mr. Loge will correct me, but I think the cost at that time was if we want to do all of Quispampsis, including the other side of the, the lake, it was like $70 million. So um, it's a very big venture. So we're, not that we would be able to do it all, but eventually, or one day, we're going to have issues with water, and, and we have to start getting as much water out there as we can. So. I'm for looking at that and looking at different ways of getting some federal provincial funding, um, at least get Hampton Road done. And I know from looking or remembering the ones from 2019, we'd go up Donlin. There's a whole bunch of different ways. So we could have two ways in case we lose lose one. But um, I'm quite for this to find out what we can do in the next few years. I know we got a lot of projects, but I'd like to remind people, and Miss Brandon, I don't know if she's still there, but in 2026, when the QPLEX loan and, and, and our other loan for CF, CM, H or whatever drops off there, we got $1.3 million that we don't just spend right away, but we have some options to, to help continue the town. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Miller. And, and the intent behind this is that uh, when I had asked to have this on the agenda was because we have talked about water on the Hampton Road now for a number of years. I've had several developers who have come to me wanting to uh, put large structures along the uh, the Hampton Road and wouldn't because there wasn't water uh, where they needed it. So I'm going to go to uh, Mr. Loge. Good evening, Mr. Loge. Welcome. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, the the issue with the strategic decision, and and I guess it'll come on two fronts. Uh, Council recognizes that we are undertaking an asset management plan that will take into account um, not just new projects, but managing and maintaining our old projects. So the the strategic decision that we would want council to undertake is what are the priorities that we want to see taken first? Um, uh, Councillor Miller is correct, is that water is gonna be, and, and your worship, you're correct, is that water will be one of the main impetus for development and increased density in the community. However, uh, if we don't manage our existing infrastructure, pump stations, existing water mains, the water tower, then what will happen is that um, we're gonna be fall, go behind the eight ball so we can't service what we have. Um, and then to your point with respect to funding, we have to recognize that the water system is a different uh, funding uh, source than say the QPLEX was. It's, it's a utility 
funding uh, model that we have to go to. So now we've got the water and the sewer, for example, using competing funds where we get to utility capital or do we redirect gas tax, uh, community building fund, or do we seek uh, other forms of infrastructure funding uh, by law being the federal provincial government. So those are the types of things that we want to undertake with our strategic decisions. Um, and, and that helps staff put together levels of service and future models. So thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Mr. Loger. Deputy Mayor Squire. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, and thank you, Mr. Loger, for your comments. And again, when you take the two of them together, I guess the, the premise of my um, requesting this is that we know that the cost of infrastructure is uh, huge, and we're before you know it, we're going to be back into budget preparations. <laughs> And I just wanted to put it at, at the top of mind um, of all council that uh, how we're going to move forward with infrastructure. Um, I do believe that um, being able to make our case to different levels of government is a priority that we should be looking at uh, to see uh, where there's um, opportunities for us to continue with these two projects. Um, it's possible. We've been doing it for quite a few years now. Uh, numerous projects going on at the same time. And um, we know that the aging in infrastructure um, can get out of control if we don't uh, spend some money on it. So I thank you, Mr. Loger, for taking the time to respond to all my emails. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Scryer. Councillor Olson, please. Thank you, Your Worship. I, I understand uh, the concerns of uh, different uh, people, but somehow we have to do both. Uh, maintain the existing infrastructure, plus start doing something about new requirements. Because uh, doing this piecemeal uh, $2, $2 million a, a year, we will never ever have water in Quispam Sis. We have a population of over 19,000 people and I would venture to uh, venture to mention that uh, probably the uh, largest municipality in all of New Brunswick without their own uh, dedicated water system. And uh, I, I think we've got to bite the bullet. Our, uh, we're challenged by our existing tax rate. We're uh, 25 cents below comparable uh, municipalities of our size. And, uh, and a lot of them have a, a water system. Uh, that's just one thing. But the more we delay it, the more the costs are going to, uh, are going to increase and uh, it's going to impact negatively, as you've mentioned, Your Worship, on the actual overall development of our community. And uh, you have to spend money to make money. And uh, I think it's about time that we uh, started uh, introducing the uh, hardcore truth to our community that uh, we're going to have, we're going to, have to uh, raise taxes possibly to uh, uh, be able to get some funding that will allow us to expand and provide additional service overall to the community. And uh, I think we've got to be in, uh, innovative in our uh, discussions and how we can attract that. But uh, I'll tell you, we've got, to, uh, we've got to strike while the iron's hot and, uh, and get federal and provincial funding involved and start picking, a, uh, picking at mm -hmm. this in a very substantial way. So uh, I don't want us to, uh, to uh, uh, restrict our uh, growth uh, and uh, impact the growth negatively by not seriously addressing it. With all due respect to uh, Mr. Loger's comments, and I'm not talking about uh, negligence and uh, not addressing this. I'm just saying that we've got to look at this very seriously and start making some commitments. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Councillor Olson. Councillor Bigger, please. Thank you, Your Worship. I don't think I could probably improve on what Councillor Olson just said, but uh, I just would, uh, I just want to express my uh, support for this uh, as well and, and, and say that I think that this requires a, a sort of a, a, a vision for the future of our town, an understanding of the evolution of our town. And uh, as we see again, uh, more and more, we see the proliferation of uh, high density housing projects that are eager to come here. There is a, uh, a sense that um, we have been, certainly the history of our town, uh, of the valley in general, is that you know it's a, uh, 
small bedroom community that has sort of an umbilical cord tied to the city. Uh, of course, we continue to have a very uh, important and healthy relationship with the city of St. John and so on. But uh, there is, and again, I'll, I'll, it's probably overstating to use the phrase self-sustaining, but I think that there is uh, a lot of opportunity for growth and evolution on both the residential and commercial side. Uh, and I think that greatly benefits our town in numerous ways. And this seems to be a real deterrent, the absence of uh, water in, municipal water infrastructure. And uh, walk into Tim Hortons and ask people, by the way, what they think about driving up that lane on uh, Hampton Road, uh, just past Lakefield Plaza. And uh, that Hampton Road is, is in a, a terrible state. It's an eyesore, frankly. Uh, and it's, uh, you sort of, you know, uh, everybody tries to shift over that lane as they go up the hill uh, past um, uh, Lakefield Plaza there. And so it's certainly long overdue, uh, in my opinion, getting uh, Hampton Road redone. I agree with what uh, Councillor Miller said. I think that if we do this, and Councillor Olson referenced this as well, doing this in piecemeal is, is going to take so long. Uh, if we have funding available to us, if our debt service ratio is healthy, if we uh, can procure, you know, assistance to do this, I, I just fully endorse uh, this as a sort of a visionary and evolutionary step for our town to take. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bigger. I'm going to go to our town treasurer, Krista Brandon. Welcome, Ms. Brandon. You're on. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I just wanted to just reiterate what uh, Mr. Loge has stated in the fact that our utility, which is funded through our utility fund, is separate from our general fund where we raise our property taxes. So our utility fund is a user pay, user um, enforced system where we, you know, charge user fees a, a rate by which we can then add to our reserves to build further infrastructure. And as I have come forward at each budget um, time since I have been there, um, asking to increase the utility rates, to prepare for this, um, to, to add to the discussion that without significant um, provincial and federal uh, contributions to this, our utility will, it will not be self-sufficient. At this point in time, with this year, with the cost increases and all of the projects that we're doing on the wastewater and using the grant funding for the CCBF, we are maxed in our utility and are now looking at ways of, you know, potentially re value engineering some of our projects, putting other things on hold. Um, we're constantly doing this as administration, trying to, you know, make sure that we do get, you know, the best value for all of the dollars that we do spend. We can go up to borrowing up to 50% of our debt ratio. We have included in our last five year plan, which council um, would have seen through the budget time. And we're taking our debt ratio from about 25 to um, almost 32% over the next few years, just to deal with the, um, you know, updating the current infrastructure that we have without adding any um, additional. So I just, I just wanted it noted that the property tax rate is separate from the utility and how we fund those. Those are two separate funds and our utility is a user pay system. And um, absolutely, we do need a lot of money in this area over the next few years. So we will need to be getting creative in how we approach our funding and how we tackle funding and how we move forward with the um, any expansion to our utility um, system going forward. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you very much, Ms. Brandon. Very insightful. Councillor Olson. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Uh, Brandon, for your uh, clarification there. I'm well aware of the uh, difference between both the both, uh, uh, budgets. All I'm saying is that uh, if money has to be allocated to the uh, utility fund, it's, uh, it's going to have to come from the same pot that every, everything else comes from. It's going to have to be dedicated and allocated to that uh, utility fund. That will be an impact on the tax rate in Quispam says. So 
somebody's got to give the money to them and we can't rely on on the province and the feds to cover all of those costs but we've got to we've got to do something and uh, we can talk about this till the cows come home and uh, it's not going to change anything but we've got to take a look at the overall impact of things and then start to start doing something because uh, it's not going to go away and I and I think uh, it's best to be proactive than reactive when we've got a major problem of uh, of contaminated water for instance and, and well water we're, we're in well water 95 percent of the community and that's i don't think that's healthy thank you thank you councillor olson there is a motion on the table on the question don't see anyone's hands raised please vote now Motion carried 7 0. Item 10 bylaws. Item A, proposed zoning bylaw amendment number 038 40, rezoning application R1 to R2, 169 Vincent Road, PID number 248518, proposed development of four unit terrace dwelling units with a total of 16. This evening we have Andrew Dunn with us and a consideration of second and third readings subject to execution of the developer's agreement. Your Worship, it was signed this afternoon, the developer's agreement by the applicant. So the developer's agreement was signed this afternoon. Councillor Olson. Thank you, Worship. I would, uh, I would move uh, second reading be given to zoning bylaw amendment number 038-40, subject to the execution of the attached Section 59 CPA Developers Agreement, which I understand we've just been told it's been signed. Thank you. It's been moved by Councillor Olson, seconded by Councillor Bigger on the question. Please vote now. Motion carried 7 0. Councillor Miller. I would move third and final reading be given to zoning bylaw amendment number 038-40, subject to the execution of the attached 59 CPA developers agreement. It's been moved by Councillor Miller, seconded by Councillor Olson on the question. Councillor Donovan. Thank you, and uh, thank you again to Mr. Dunn for choosing to uh, invest in our community. Thanks. Did you have anything else? Thank you. Please vote now. Motion carried 7-0. Thank you very much for your patience this evening, Mr. Dunn. Item 10B, review of proposed changes to Council Code of Conduct bylaw number 056, consideration of third and final reading. And you have a motion. Councillor Donovan. Do we have to read the entire, what is there? Or can I just say third, third motion or third reading? Uh, Local Governance Act. So it, the motion is summarized. It's a little longer of a motion than normal, but you do not have to read the full bylaw. But he's to read what's on his screen. Yes. Please read what's on your screen. Okay. Um, now, therefore, be it resolved that third and final reading be given to... No. Motion. What Whereas, am I reading? There's four people talking to me at once. What am I reading? Okay, I asked Please. you to read the motion as you see it on your screen. Whereas okay. a public notice has been okay, published. I'll read it. Yes. Uh, Whereas a public notice has been published on the Quiz PMSIS website pursuant to Section 15.3 and 15.4 of the Local Govern Governance Act that describes proposed bylaw amendments or amendment 
number 056-01, a bylaw of the municipality of Crispamsis, respecting the council code of conduct by title and gen generally by subject matter, and further, that the bylaw amendment proposes, proposes to incorporate the following summary of changes. Number one, a more detailed description in the conflict of interest section with the proposed new language mirroring the, the wording in the Local Gov Governance Act. Uh, number two, the addition of an informal complaint process as an option under the complaint section. Three, a clearer no outline of the process to be used when council is addressing formal complaints. Four, changing the review requirements of the Code of Conduct bylaw to take place within the first 12 months of a municipal election versus every four years. Five, the addition of a clause requiring that in instances where members provide a personal view or opinion on social media, they take steps to ensure that such personal views or opinions are not continue, or construed to be those of the town or council as a whole. Six, the addition of a new section that acknowledges members should have no expectation of privacy on their town devices and all town business communications is subject to the RTIPA legislation. Seven, the addition of suspension from council meetings under sanctions. Eight, the addition of a new section under sanctions for the provision of a removal of town device. Nine, the addition of an, of a, of an appendix A, which is a statement of commitment to the code of conduct and further proposed bylaw amendment number 054 01 re received first and second reading at the February 21st, 2023 regular meeting. Now, therefore, be it resolved that third and final reading, reading be given to proposed bylaw amendment number 04, 054 01, a bylaw respecting. Uh, Councillor Donovan, it's been moved by Councillor Seconded by Councillor Thompson on the question. Please vote now. Motion carried 7 0. Next week, or at our next meeting, rather, there will be a form on your, at your table with a statement of commitment to the Code of Conduct for each councillor and myself to sign. Item 10C Local Improvement Bylaw Number 011 2022 Levying of Costs on Property Owners for 2022 Storm Sewer Drainage Installations. Staff report from town clerk. And there's a motion there. Councillor Olson. Thank you, Worship. Uh, notice of warrant of assessment, whereas pursuant to by law number Q11-2022, passed on the 16th day of August 2022, the Council of the Town of Quispamsis has completed as a local improvement the installation of storm sewer works at a cost of $45,324.56 within the 12 months preceding the 31st day of March 2023. And whereas pursuant by two bylaw number Q11-2022 of the Town of Quispamsis, the owner's portion of the cost of the work to be raised by special frontage assessment is $33,993.42. And whereas such frontage assessment is payable in either one lump sum or 10 annual assessments, uh, annual installments, the town treasurer is therefore requested to assess the levy, the sum of $33,993.42 on the several pa uh, parcels of land abutting on the said work and cause the same to be collected and paid by either one lump sum of 10 or 10 annual installments by the owner of such parcels in accordance with the provisions of the bylaws of the town of Quispamsis. Thank you, Councillor Olson. It's been moved by Councillor Olson, seconded by Councillor Miller on the question. Please vote now. Motion carried 7-0, item 11, new business. Item A, 
RFP 2023 TQ02-4, Engineering Services Street Infrastructure Design and Tender, Millennium Drive and Quispamses Road. And you have a recommendation there. Councillor Miller. I'd move that it is recommended that RFP 2023 TQ02-4 Engineering Services Street Infrastructure Design and Tender Millennium Drive and Quistensis Road be awarded to Englobe for the upset fee of $140,822.10, includes HST, and the town staff be directed to meet with the consultant as soon as possible to commence a Part A of the project for the upset fee of $35,034.75, inclusive of HST. The project will require council approval prior to, prior to proceeding to Part B. It's been moved by Councillor Miller, seconded by Councillor Bigger on the question. Please vote now. Motion carried 7 0. Item, 10, uh, item 11B, RFP 2023 TQ01 1, Engineering Services, Utility Department, Asset Management Plan. And there is a uh, recommendation there. Councillor Bigger. Thank you, Worship. I <clears throat> move that Council accept staff's recommendation that consulting services. RFP 2023 TQ01-1 Engineering Services Utility Department Asset Management Plan, that's a mouthful, be awarded to GemTech for the upset fee of $56,562.75, including HST, and the town staff be directed to meet with the consultant as soon as possible to commence the project. Council will be advised of any scope of work changes that impact the budget. Thank you, it's been moved by Councillor Bigger, seconded by Councillor Donovan on the question. Deputy Mayor Scryer. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you to Mr. Loge, um, I'm glad we're, to see we're having this done. My question is, um, will this be ready for when we start to have our strategic plan discussions on infrastructure? Uh, through you, Your Worship. The asset management plan from the utility management side will not be done um, if council wishes to have our strategic discussions within the next two months or three months. Uh, the intent is to have this done prior to budget. Um, our target date for completion is August uh, for, for the asset management plan. Um, with respect to the strategic discussion, um, and we've, we've sort of pushed that back and forth between utility and water, it's to help staff give us a feel for what our priorities of council um, so that we can work with uh, the treasurer and come back to you with recommendations of, of funding models and things of that nature. Um, so, so this is one tool that we will use because it impacts both the water and the sewer side of things. But, but quite frankly, um, your strategic discussions will create a level of service uh, model that will be used in our asset management plan. So we would be encouraging council to actually have these discussions in advance of completion of the, the asset management plan, because then that helps us uh, put forward the uh, funding uh, forecasts. So those are the, those are the, the, the uh, so it's, a, it's appropriate time to make sure that uh, your thoughts, council thoughts as a whole is in place prior to, or in, in, in parallel with the development of this asset management plan, your worship. Thank you, Mr. Loge. Councillor Donovan. I don't know how my light get on. I didn't press it, but I don't have a question. It's been moved by Councillor Bigger, seconded by Councillor Donovan. Please vote now. Motion carried 7-0. Item 11C, tender recommendation 2023 TQ-01. Dash three, Gondola Point Road, lift station number five, upgrades, and you have a recommendation in front of you. Councillor Olson. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, based on staff review and information provided here, and it is recommended that Council award RFP number 2023 TQ01-3 to the low bid proposal from Fairville Construction Limited for the proposal bid of $2,406,300 
plus HST and to enter negotiations uh, with the successful bidder to examine the project scope of work for potential cost savings. Any additional costs for the WWPS project will be assigned from, an a from any 2023 surplus if any are realized or as a reallocation of public reserves or as a result of a deferral of planned capital expenditures for 2023. Thank you. The recommendation has been moved by Councillor Olson, seconded by Councillor Miller on the question. Please vote now. Motion carried seven uh, unanimously. Reports, item number 12. Councillor Donovan. Move that reports be received and filed. It's been moved by Councillor Donovan, seconded by Councillor Olson on the question. Councillor Donovan. Thank you. I will say that I am uh, appreciative of uh, both the mayors of the town of Quispamarase for um, writing or drafting a letter uh, on behalf of the library board. Uh, signaling the need for a uh, an additional full-time employee for our, our library. You know, our, our library over the years has grown quite significantly. And, um, you know, it's, I can understand sometimes it's financially, it's difficult for the province to do things. However, I, I do believe that, um, you know, now is the time for us to get a full-time, an extra full-time employee to benefit our community. And uh, hopefully the province of New Brunswick will take a, uh, a second look at that, especially with your support. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Donovan. Councillor Olson. Oh, sorry, Your Honor, no. On the question, please vote now. Motion carried, 7-0. Item number 13, business arising from the Committee of the Whole. There was none. Looking for an adjournment. No. Hoping everyone finds joy in the coming week. It's spring. Let's get out and enjoy some fresh air. Moved by Councillor Olson. Seconded by Councillor Donovan on the question. Motion. Motion carried 7 0. Did you get that? I did. Okay. Wait now. Uh, Councillor Donovan. Yes. yes, he did. He said yes. Good night, everyone. Thank you for being here this evening. Motion carried 7 0. Meeting adjourned.